uh, emissions. So we know that we are lacking dust grains in the inner disk regions. And then uh, there was the first uh, SMS observation that showed that um, they were that this disk actually looked like a ring. And then you have uh, three types of substructures, say, that are dominating. So rings, rings and gaps, uh, multiple rings and gaps. Spiral arm, like you can see here. And what we call asymmetries, crescents, uh, arcs, there are many ways to call them, uh, as this one or these ones here. So they're uh, um, very regularly observed. And up to October, there were uh, 100 and 120 disks that were observed with a resolution of about 10 to 20 AU. And here I'm showing uh, the disk millimeter brightness against the stellar mass and the disk size against the stellar mass. And in black is the general disk population. The disks that have substructures are the one in orange, and they are basically the, the brightest disk. And they're also the largest disks. The disk that we observed that did not show detectable substructures can also be bright, because that's one of our observational bias that we only look at bright disks. Uh, but they are, general, in general, very compact. That tends to uh, tell us that we are actually still limited in the angular resolution that uh, we need to observe substructures in the dust. And if we go down in resolution at uh, resolution smaller than 10 astronomical units, then 60 disks have been observed until now, and 85% show substructures. And the 15% uh, left are disks that are either edge on or in multiple system. So that tends to tell us that we have substructures, we always have substructures. It's only that we are limited in how we can uh, especially resolve them. So out of all the substructures, uh, gaps and rings are in the means of continuum emission are the most common. They are found literally at every possible radii. And in general, um, the single or double ring systems are the ones that dominate. Um, they are found in all spectral type from N5 to A0 in both young and very young disk, so even at class one stage. And in all disks like uh, 10, 10 year, years old. Um, the properties of the disk vary great, varies greatly depending on the disk. And for example, you have um, a contrast between the ring and the gap that can be really high. So basically, almost an empty gap in the dust. And sometimes you have very, very shallow gaps. And this is one example of ACE29, the one that I was showing is multiple rings and gap. Uh, and the red dot profile, you can see that you have very shallow and very deep uh, gaps. Some rings, not all of them, but some rings look consistent with, with dust trapping. So dust being trapped at the pressure maximum. And this, in this trap, we expect grains to be in favorable conditions to grow and to grow up to planetesimal. Um, so this is an example of a few rings from the D-Shark survey published by Case Lemont, where here in, in green is the, basically the beam. Um, in orange, it's the pressure scale height. And in blue, the measurements of the width of the ring um, in the dust. And for the rings that have a smaller width in the dust than the pressure scale height, these are strong indications of dust trapping. And we also have this, um, I mean, this evidence of dust trapping when we look at these rings at multiple wavelengths, for example, spectral index, uh, especially result. One interesting feature is that these uh, rings seem to have an almost constant optical depth that could be explained by the production of planetesimals. So the other kind of substructures in the millimeter are spirals and asymmetries, which I put together here. Uh, so you have this kind of symmetry that are isolated, say, and uh, this one here. But we also have within rings, within the system of gaps and rings, also this kind of very small asymmetries here. And it's unclear whether these two kinds of asymmetries, categories of asymmetries, are really tracing the same processes or at least the same origin. Then we have spiral arms. Uh, here you can see one that is uh, quite uh, closed. And uh, here, a second type of spiral arm. So to be able to, this in general, the spiral, spiral arms are very faint. So to be able to detect them, sometimes we have to subtract the overall uh, emission from the disk to look at, to enhance basically the, the, the substructure. So they are in general rare, and they're also mostly found around these that uh, have cavities and around both t stars and her big stars, and both around multiple and, and multiple, sorry, single and multiple system. And for example, this one is a binary system that is known. So we think that these spirals are actually driven by the tidal interaction uh, with the companion. 
in the infrared scattered light. And the, the same basically uh, overview is that we see a lot of soft structures in bright disk. So as soon as we observe a disk that is bright enough in scattered light, we, we think that we see uh, these soft structures. And we see them very regularly around uh, objects, in disk around objects at, of all spectral type. And the three main categories of uh, substructures are rings and gap, again, spiral arms, uh, again, associated with a dust depleted cavity, and another, another kind of feature or substructure that we call shadows. Of course, shadow is already an interpretation. What we see is only a dark vision. So you can see here um, that this disk is dark on the west side. And this we interpret as being due to the shadow from a misaligned inner disk region. So we call them shadows, uh, even though we cannot uh, always prove that they are shadows. So, so far we have observed 130 disks in uh, infrared scattered light with resolution uh, going from 5 to 15 AU. We detect 60% of them and 40, disk, uh, 40 of them have substructures. And in general, we see the substructures every time the disk is quite bright. So here is a, a combination of, of observations going from faint to bright disk. And here we start seeing, uh, for example, the spirals. Here there are shadows. And the faint is the disk, obviously, the more difficult it is to uh, detect anything. But this disk, for example, HK loop, is one of the brightest disks in the sub-millimeter continuum. So it's not because it's faint in the infrared scattered light, it's actually a faint disk in the millimeter, obviously not tracing the same. And why they can appear faint, um, we think that they can be faint also due to the fact that there is cell shadowing from the inner disk region. And this is something that has been known also and predicting since a really long time, where you have an inner disk that is puffed up and then cast a shadow on the outer disk, or the outer disk can be uh, in an advanced set, um, um, setting stage. And we also have, of course, sensitivity issue because we are observing uh, all of these is from the ground. And of course, if you compare with, for example, HST observation, sometimes we see very expanded disk signal up to 500 AU, while with uh, the ground-based observation, we can sometimes just detect down to uh, up to 50 AU. So this is a sketch um, that shows the, the dominance of uh, substructures, rings and spirals. We're going to focus on these two depending on spectral type and near fraud excess and uh, dust mass. So we can see that rings are found at all spectral type but are really dominant among T-Tory stars. And they're also dominant among targets that have low near fraud excess. Um, in contrast, the spirals are also found at all spectral type but are really dominating um, in the early type objects. And what is really interesting is that we found that spirals are associated with large near fraud excess and that's where the connection from um, between the outer and the inner disk comes in. But these disks uh, most likely have a very perturbed inner disk region with dust uh, lifted up. So we have um, strong observational limitation. Uh, first, because we, as I was saying, we have only observed the bright disk, uh, both in the infrared and in the sub-millimeter. And we have really um, constrained ourselves to the early uh, spectral times. And the second limitation is, of course, the angular resolution. And the sensitivity is more important for the gas observations. And these are two examples of disks uh, that uh, were found to be a transition disks. And um, once you observe them with the much higher angular resolution, you see that these rings is actually made of two rings with a plateau outside and also some emission inside the cavity and a needle disk. And this one, um, the outer ring becomes actually resolved in three rings. Um, and the inner ring becomes this very clumpy um, ring of, of, of dust with filament going inwards and also an inner, uh, unresolved inner disk. So the question is, um, how high in angular resolution do we need to go to be able to have a proper overview of substructures in disk? So we know that we have uh, substructures, but of course the interesting question is what are causing the substructures? And this is something that I will not uh, discuss about. Uh, just briefly mentioned that, of course, we want to find planets. So we think that all the substructures are tracing planets um, or could be uh, subtle companions. Uh, but they are also non planet or non companion um, related scenarios like MHD instabilities, MHD winds, gravitational instability, um, infall of the envelope, so residual infall from um, the envelope. Um, and also a change of local conditions uh, through the disk. 
And this can create rings. Um, some of these scenarios create spirals and asymmetries. And so far, there, there have um, been a lot of theoretical development in comparison with the observations. And I encourage you to look at Jehan's uh, MIA preview talk from two weeks ago that is online and reviews uh, all of these uh, scenarios and check his PP7 chapter when it's available. What I can say from my um, uh, observer point of view is that uh, the model assumption, of course, has a significant impact on the predicted substructures. So for example, if you, depending on the cooling time scale of your disk, for example, you might get uh, multiple rings or just one ring if you include the planet. Um, if you go, if you use 3D versus 2D um, model, obviously this also has a strong impact on how you can predict uh, these substructures. This is quite challenging. Um, but the, one of the greatest challenges also comes from the observations. And why is that? Is because um, when you look at an object with one wavelength, you're happy, you, you have a model and it fits perfectly. And now you look at another wavelength and then you're in trouble. And that's uh, an example of I look, for example, seen scattered eye, where you see this beautiful bowl shape and the methane here, uh, the methane uh, seen in the dark lane. When you look in the semi-meter, you see spiral arms. In this case, HD 135, in scattered light, you see a dust depleted cavity and these two spiral arms. And in semi-meter, we have a ring and an asymmetry. So really the question that we want to ask is, um, are the mechanisms responsible for the substructure that I see in the surface the same, also responsible for the substructure that I see in the mid-plane or are they completely disconnected? And if they are not disconnected, what are the physical conditions that allow these dynamical processes to lead to this different coupling regime and different substructures uh, at different wavelengths? So one thing that we can do by combining obs observation at different wavelengths is um, to constrain the dust dynamics. And the first thing that we can do is to look at the efficiency of dust settling. So we need to have dust settling to have very dense regions where we can grow uh, planetesimo and for planets. And these are beautiful observations obtained uh, with HST, where you can see the disk, the silhouette of the disk here, so you can see that the disk has a vertical structure, a vertical height. And in the contours, these are the continuum observations so, um, uh, of these three disks that are edge-on. And you can see the continuum emission is very thin and is really contained to um, the narrow plane. So with multi-wavelength observation also, for example, going from 0 0.8 to two millimeter, you can also look at the, uh, the efficiency of those settings, different, tracing different grain sizes, um, assuming that you will be more sensitive to larger grains at two millimeter than at 0 0.8 millimeter. You can see that the width of this mid plane is actually uh, getting thinner and narrower. And this is consistent with a very low turbulence um, parameter of 10 to the minus four, Q10 to the minus four. And this is of course uh, model dependent, but that assumes that that shows that uh, our disk are uh, quite settled. And the other thing that you can look at is the dust dynamics readily. So this goes vertically. And now readily we have also evidence uh, for efficient radial drift. When we combine the, the observation is scattered that, that traces small grains, so you see that the disk of TW hydra is quite extended. And in the centimeter, this is how it looks. So you can see that all the small grains, uh, all the large grains, sorry, have drifted inward uh, towards the inner disk region and are contained in a much uh, smaller region than um, the scattered light shows. But also the gap widths and the gap location and the depths differ uh, between the small and the large grains. And we want to interpret this as resulting from uh, the interaction with uh, a planet. And of course, assuming disk viscosity and a specific disk um, um, conditions. And another important uh, result when combining these two tracers is that we see that the small grains are always located in transition disk inward of the large grain. So this ring of LK calcium 15 is actually located inward of this uh, bright millimeter ring. And we also have small grains in the inner disk, reaching the inner disk region up to where we can see them with the coronagraph. And this uh, special segregation in dust size is something that we expect with a companion. For example, if you have a planet here, then it will create a pressure maximum where all the large grains will be trapped. But the small grain can still drift inward uh, in the cavity and towards the inner disk. So you would have an inner disk, small grains, 
and then uh, the, the millimeter grade being tracked. And that's what we observe. Now we can use spirals as a probe for the temperature structure. And why is that? It's because the opening angle of spiral is directly related to the temperature, the local temperature. So if you can measure spiral in the surface that is very hot and in the midplane that is very cold, then you have a direct and um, measure different pitch angles, opening angle, you have a direct probe of the temperature. And this is um, the spiral wake, um, so the polar scene polar map uh, for an isothermal model where you can see that if everything has the same temperature, the spiral has the same opening angle. But if you look um, at what we call stratified this, so a hot surface and a cold midplane, you will see in the near infrared that your spiral are more open than in the sun millimeter. And this is what we see in this disk, where we have, um, as I was mentioning before, a binary um, companion likely responsible for the spirals. In the, in the infrared, you cannot see it very well, but the spirals are very open, while in the sun millimeter here in the, in the contour, they are very close. You can also uh, look at spiral in the dust at probe, as a probe of the uh, the mass of the disk. And this we could do only in one object so far, um, in LIS 27, where we have this uh, strong spiral in the sun emitter dust emission at different wavelengths, and also there is a gap here. And these spirals are uh, likely tracing gravitational instability. And there are other tracers uh, in this disk, the other observation, and the, the, the gas is uh, very important here. You can see here in the 13th year in the C18 node, that the east side of the disk looks more extended than the west side. This is due to um, um, contam cloud contam contamination. But here you can see that it's, uh, there is a gap and that the east side is also more extended than the west side. And when we look at uh, velocity maps, uh, what we see is that there are these arcs here that are strong departure from Keplerian rotation. All of these um, elements are consistent with gravitational instability taking place in this disk and trapping the dust in spiral arms. So another type of substructures that I mentioned in Scatterdax are uh, shadows. Shadows that we interpret as tracing inner and outer disk in its alignment. And these are two examples, two different examples where you can see that the shadows have uh, different uh, morphologies. Here they're very narrow, uh, while well here we have two different, two narrow shadow and also this um, broad shadow uh, hiding uh, the west side. And we reproduce um, the observation with relative transfer model, assuming a certain geometry. And for example, for this one, we assumed a misalignment uh, up to 70 degrees. We have a inner disk that is tilted with respect to the outer disk by 70 degrees. And we have a near side of the inner disk that is not the same as the near side of the outer disk. So it's really a flipped inner disk. For this one, to have a very broad shadow, we need to have a moderate misalignment. And here, for example, just think of a misalignment of about 20, 30 degrees. What happens is that um, the star can still irradiate through the dust free inner hole um, at the dust remation edge and will irradiate um, one side of the disk only. Uh, um, on the short radial extent, while on the other side of the disk, it will irradiate the entire surface, and that will create this uh, asymmetry. But what we found that is, was really interesting and surprising is that this, this, this shadow, sorry, are variable uh, in time. And you can see here that there are uh, three shadow lanes that vary um, very rapidly. And here it's even uh, more striking. We have this nearly face on disk with two shadows that change not only in location, but also in the shape, sometimes splitting in multiple small shadows. And it's with a time scale that is really out of um, within one day. So that's where we're connecting with the inner disk is that we are tracing the outer disk, the direct um, consequence of a very dynamical inner disk. In this case, especially in this case, we. Uh, believe that the inner disk is almost polar with respect to the outer disk and, and cast these two shadows. But because we have these shadows that are moving so fast, we also think that we must have an inner disk that is very clumpy, very asymmetric. Uh, that could be either uh, from a disk wind, an asymmetric disk wind, or maybe uh, through the base of the accretion columns. More recently, we've been trying to look at this misalignment in transition disk in a sample of 20 transition disks. So we observe 
with VRTI as Rebecca was showing yesterday uh, in the continuum, the near-infrared thermal emission from the, the hot dust. And using very simple model, we derived the inclination and position angle out of um, 20 transition disks. And then we wanted to compare to the inclination and position angle of the outer disk. And for that, we used uh, the CO emission and the velocity, the kinematics of the CO emission of the outer disk with ALMA. And what we do is that we um, take the velocity map, we subtract, we, we fit it, we fit the best Keperian disk uh, model, as also fitting for the surface of the disk, for the shape of the surface of the disk. And we subtract this model and get a beautiful residual map that shows a lot of substructures. But from this best model, we can estimate the inclination and the position angle of the outer disk and compare it to the one of the inner disk. And that's for uh, this object here, for which we have these two narrow shadow. And indeed, we find that with these measurements of the inner disk and of the outer disk, we found a misalignment of 67 degrees, which is what we were, um, what we needed to reproduce uh, our observation with relative transfer model. So at least in this case, it works really well. From the, the um, inclination and position angle that we derive for the inner disk and the outer disk, we can also predict whether the disk would have shadows and where the shadows would be. We have two kinds of solutions, depending on whether the inner disk and the outer disk have the same near side or whether the inner disk and the outer disk do not share the same near side. And so these are four observations of her big star and a Titori star that, that show evidence for shadows in scattered light here and here, here and here. And these are the two families of solutions that we have. And we found that at least for these objects, our measurements of the inner disk with uh, the LTI and of the outer disk with ALMA actually match quite well the, the, the observation in scattered light. So for six out of 20 disks, uh, we find misalignment from 15 to, to 67 degrees. We find that five out of 20 objects uh, are very consistent with being aligned. But unfortunately for nine of the objects, so half of our small sample, uh, we cannot um, get to a very strong conclusion, either because the disks are two phase on, which makes the estimate uh, difficult of the, the morphology, or because they are titory stars that are um, uh, barely resolved with VLTI. Uh, as I was mentioning before, the shadows, or well, maybe I didn't mention it at all, but the shadows are usually seen among uh, her big stars with high near excess and also with spirals. Um, for the Herbig stars. And um, so there must be a connection between uh, these shadows that are tracing the inner disk indirectly and the fact that we have a high near for excess, meaning that there must be a larger processing area. Um, also, the, the connection between this and the spark is, of course, not so straightforward, but could probably um, mean that there is a companion, a, a massive companion in the cavity. Uh, responsible for the misaligned inner disk and the spiral. So that's what we were thinking until um, yesterday, um, until recently, and yesterday this was raised in Sylvia's talk, whether it's the inner disk or the outer disk that is misaligned. And I think that most of us who work on tra transition disks always think that it's the inner disk that is misaligned, and the outer disk should be aligned with the stellar uh, rotation axis. And we think about this because we have a cavity, so there must be a companion there. Uh, but of these three, so tiny sample, three titory stars, so not herbic stars, um, that are transition disks and also deepers, um, the inner disk is inclined with the star. So, um, so the question, I guess, for this audience is whether it's um, a signature that is actually for this object, the outer disk that's misaligned and not the inner disk. In which case, as Antonia was mentioning yesterday, it could be due to late accretion events or the accretion from the cloud with a different angular momentum orientation, angular momentum vector orientation. And we see also in scatterlight this um, signature of a large scale uh, info. That's the, the observation of S. Uriga uh, that has this large nebulosity image by HST. And this is from the ground with the VLT sphere, where you can see the streamers, the streamer here and uh, a lot of spirals, a lot of substructures, um, very fine structures, and this dark region here that we interpret again as a misaligned inner disk. And this uh, streamer has been actually seen with ALMA detected in the gas at much larger scales. So this is six arc seconds that we are more or less here in scattered light. And um, what was really nice here was to combine the velocity structure. So the looking at where 
we had blue shifted and red shifted emission and combine this with the scattering angle that we can get the scattering geometry from the scattered light observation. And by combining both, we could... Two minutes, Miriam. Sorry. Okay, I should go faster then. Uh, we, should, uh, we could conclude that this was um, uh, likely an, an info for material that would cause the disk misalignment. So I'll jump very briefly to uh, my final point, which is uh, the protoplanets that are embedded in this disk. So we think that these substructures are tracing uh, embedded planets and using models, you can derive the planet population. And that's the one here in yellow. But this is still very challenging to do, to detect these planets with direct imaging. And the only case that we have so far is, is PDS-70, where we found uh, B here and C here that has a signal that is blent with the Arctic disk. And these two planets are found to be accreted because they uh, were found in H-alpha. When you zoom into the, the millimeter emission, uh, this is in the continuum, the dust is well trapped in the outer disk, and these are location of the two planets. We find evidence for emission co-located with PDS-70C and close to PDS-70B. And we have new observations that uh, confirm this, so we especially resolve the emission uh, around PDS-70C that is unresolved, so we can constrain that it has an outer radius that is about 1 AU. We find very faint emission around PDS and TV that only shows up when we degrade our angular resolution and its morphology is not so clear. And the inner disk is found to be optically seen, so probably um, resulting of only small brains that um, have drifted inward uh, through the cavity and through these two planets. So what I haven't uh, discussed in the talk um, is a lot of substructure that were found also in the gas. So I only briefly mentioned those for the gravitational instability. But we know um, that the, the gas is what is dominating the mass budget, but also the, the whole uh, dynamical evolution and evolution of the disk. And that's what we want to probe with our large program, XOALMA, um, where we are going to observe 15 disks uh, with very deep observation and very high spectral resolution. And I encourage you to check uh, Richard Teague MIA talk. It's also available online uh, on this topic. So um, my summary and open question is that uh, we find substructures in disk in all bright disks. Uh, gaps and rings are the most common. But if you use multi-wavelength approach, you can constrain the dust dynamics. There is a long list of questions, and I only selected five of them. Uh, the most obvious one is, uh, do planets form first or do substructures form first and help planet formation? What is the demographic of substructures in compact this and in uh, low mass are, which are uh, dominating the star population? And how do these substructures evolve with time? And how do they affect the disk evolution in general since uh, in gas we will have different temperature and chemistry, for example, conditions? And finally, what is the impact of um, environmental effects, so I'm talking multiplicity, uh, uh, irradiation, um, in, info from the envelope on the formation of substructures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miriam. That was a great talk. Uh, do we have any questions here? In I'm the... sorry for the time because my, my timer was uh, actually a clock, so it's still at 29, 26. I'm sorry too, Miriam. I was <laughs> supposed to give you a five minute warning, but I was so interested in your talk that I completely forgot to look at the clock. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, no Patrick? Yeah, thanks for the, for the very comprehensive review. Um, about this misalignment, um, somehow you seem to, to think that if the, the, that the inner disk must have formed before the outer disk. I, I don't think it's necessarily the case. I mean, if you accrete materials with low angular momentum, uh, you can have whatever situation you want. So, um, so that, that's a, a first remark. And then, um, so I was not sure to understand correctly whether you could uh, roll out or, or confirm that the misalignment may be due to a companions or, or not. Um, but general, generally speaking, I would certainly believe that uh, the presence of this misaligned um, structure 
if a companion can be rolled out is a strong evidence of late accretions. Okay, and, and meaning that probably um, it's important to, um, your last statement, uh, the environmental effect is something very important maybe that even so we are at the late phase, maybe environment it's still important and should be fully uh, considered in the, in the DISC models. Yes, I, I totally agree. And um, Jehan uh, will talk about this uh, more later today. Um, so indeed, for your first point, it's a really good point. Um, I think we were, I mean, because we, we started seeing this misalignment in transition, this, we always think that they have this cavity, so there must be something. So I guess we, we really got stuck into the, uh, the idea that the misaligned company will drive the misalignment. Now, can we roll it out? Uh, it's difficult because these are still very small uh, cavities where direct imaging cannot perform well. We have a coronal drive that is hiding this region in general. Uh, so we are really trying to assess um, to get the best detection limit in this area, but it's, there, is, there will always be, I think, a region uh, between say uh, one AU to 10 AU where it will be very difficult to assess the presence of um, companion that are not equal mass binaries, that are, you know, like mass ratio of 0.1. Um, so, well, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure we can really build that out. But we are looking for evidence of the late uh, accretion events um, through large scale features. Yeah, so um, with, with Xiaowan, uh, we did this stuff a while ago where we argued that in transitional disks, based on uh, limits on from the SED and from uh, accretion rates, that the small dust had to be pretty depleted relative to the gas in the inner, in the inner uh, gap. Uh, can you tell whether that's still the case from direct imaging? So your question is whether the inner disk is uh, depleted? Yeah, we, we inferred that the small dust had to be really, uh, that the dust to gas ratio for the small dust had to be really small. Uh, can you yes. tell anything about that? Yeah, so um, this um, is difficult to assess. I mean, we are working on it. I, I mean, as a community, not just uh, me. Um, it's difficult to assess because we do not have, from the, the infrared, scattered like we're still seeing something that is optically sick. So it's really difficult to know how much small dust we have there. Um, and how much gas we have there is also very complicated because we have CO, which is optically thick. And when it's when we see, um, basically we need to have a thermal chemical model. Um, so I think the work of uh, Ninka von der Maal showed that there is a lot of depletion of the gas in transition disk. Uh, now, what is the error bar associated to that? Uh, I cannot tell. What we can do, what we are trying to do right now, is to have multiple wavelength observation in the sub millimeter of the inner disk uh, to constrain the dust size, because we see, for example, in PDS-70 that we have a very faint inner disk. And these are, these are due only to small grains or large grains, of course. Um, um, the estimate of the dust mass is not the same. Um, so I think this, um, yeah, from different isotopologues and different dust tracers, we might be able to answer this question. Um, okay, if we have a question on Zoom. If you can try to ask it quickly, please. Uh, Shinzuke, would you like to ask your question? Okay, um, I have a question about the variable shadow. The, is the central star a deeper? Um, yes, they are. Um, so the, the one that has this uh, variable shadow that goes super fast, yes. And the other one, I think it's a Herbig F star. Um, so I don't think it has been qualified as a deeper, but the audience will know better than me. Um, yes, but the one that has the, the shadow that moved really fast and broke break into multiple shadows, yeah, it's a deeper. Thank you. All right, well, sadly we have to move on because uh, we're running a little bit late already. So thank you very much, Miriam, right. for your talk. Um, so the next speaker is uh, Cambridge Schwartz from the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy, um, but she's not able to join us live. So it's a pre-recorded talk and she won't be there to answer any questions, but um, you can put your questions on Slack and, uh, and tag her and, 
And she will be able to answer them later, I imagine. Um, yes, yeah, so we will be hearing about the GM Auriga disc. Hi, I'm Canberra Schwartz. I recently moved from a postdoc at University of Arizona to one at MPIA. I would love to present this talk to you live, but unfortunately, as you are watching this, I am stuck on a bus. So I would like to thank the organizers not only for the opportunity to share my results, but for the ability to do so asynchronously. I am going to be talking about my work through the MAPS large program on the GMORIGA disk, but first a bit of background. Now, disk mass is one of the most fundamental properties of a disk. However, it can be very difficult to measure because the majority of this mass is in H2, which does not emit throughout much of the protoplanetary disk. So instead we have to use tracers such as dust, which makes up less than 1% of the mass, but is observable as long as it is at wavelengths smaller than about centimeter size. Or we can use gas tracers. Uh, gases besides H2 make up less than 0.01% of the total mass. The most common of these gas tracers is CO shown here. However, if we look at masses derived from CO and masses derived from gas, we find a discrepancy. Uh, here we're showing masses for uh, disks from several surveys. And you can see that the estimates almost always disagree with CO generally giving a lower mass than dust, which would suggest that the CO is underabundant relative to the dust. However, if this is due to a total lower gas mass or just to a low CO abundance is unclear unless we have a third mass tracer to break this degeneracy. One additional way to trace mass is the H2 isotopolog HD, which was observed in three protoplanetary disks by Herschel. And if we use these HD detections to get the mass, uh, we get masses for these objects between a minimum mass solar nebula uh, and about uh, an order of magnitude more massive than that. And we get CO abundances that are between a factor of a few and two orders of magnitude below what we see in the ISM. So this tells us that it is CO and not the total gas, which is missing. And CO is a bad mass tracer. One caveat to using HD as a mass tracer is that the HD emission has a very strong degeneracy between the temperature of the gas and the HD abundance. Uh, so on this plot of that uh, mass versus gas temperature, uh, you can see that any combination of points along this line would be consistent with the observations of HD in TW Hydra. Additionally, HD only emits at temperatures warmer than 20K and a significant fraction of your gas mass is going to be colder than that. So HD derived masses are going to be sensitive to the assumed temperature that you use. And while CO is not a great mass tracer, it is a great way to probe gas temperature, particularly when you have very high spatial resolution observations as shown here. Uh, so this is an image of CO in I am loop, I believe. Uh, and you can see as we move in velocity space that the morphology of the emission changes. Um, and we can clearly see an upper surface of emission and a lower surface of emission. And we can then project back to the distance from the midplane, uh, as shown in this schematic here, along each point on this surface to directly measure the emission height as a function of radius so that you are now able to measure the temperature of the gas in two dimensions, so as a function of both Z and R. And that brings me to 
the AMA MAPS large program. This was PI'd by Karen Oberg, Viviana Guzman, Catherine Walsh, Yuri Akawa, and Ted Bergen. This is a line survey of five protoplanetary disks in all of bands three and four at 0 0.15 to three arc second resolution. And if you want more information on the results as well as access to all of the data products, those can be found at ama-maps.info. For this particular talk, I am going to be focusing on GMOREGA, which is this second line from the top. Uh, and you may remember that this is one of the three protoplanetary disks with an HD detection. So my role within MAPS was to take these six lines of CO and CO isotopolog emission from MAPS, along with five archival observations from my own ALMA program, as well as the spatially unresolved HD detection, and build a disk physical chemical model, which is able to reproduce the HD flux, as well as the 2D morphology of these 11 CO lines. And the goal here is to have a map of the H2 distribution, the CO distribution, and the gas temperature in two dimensions for this disk. Geomorega is a three million year old transition disk. You can clearly see the inner cavity in this band six millimeter uh, image. Um, and you can also see that we have these bright and dark rings of dust emission. So when building our model, we did include this dust substructure based on the previous modeling work by Maceus et al. in 2018, which was able to reproduce not only the millimeter, but the centimeter continuum as well. For our modeling process, we start with the spectral energy distribution and build a dust structure model in RADMC3D that is able to reproduce that SED. We then pass this model to the thermochemical modeling code, RAC2D, which calculates the chemistry and the temperature in the disk simultaneously. After that model is run, we run radiative transfer on these CO and HD lines and compare these synthetic observations to the actual observations. We then modify the physical parameters in the disk and the CO abundance, iterating through this process until we get a good fit to the data. What I am showing here are the radial intensity profiles for our 11 CO transitions. The data and associated uncertainties are shown in blue, and our best fit model is shown in red. On the whole, you can see that we're doing a pretty good job of matching the intensity at all radii within the uncertainties. In addition, our model HD 1 to 0 flux agrees perfectly with the flux that was observed by Herschel. I won't go into detail about all of the other models that we try to fit to the data, uh, but suffice it to say that the red line is definitely our best fit. So what can we tell from this model? Well, first off, our best fit model is for a rather massive disk of 0.2 solar masses. This is compared to a central star mass of 1.1 solar masses and implies a gas to dust ratio of almost 300 compared to the typically assumed value of 100. 47% of this mass is inside of 100 AU as shown here, but 75% of the HD emission is inside of 100 AU. And that is because this disk is also rather cold, with 32% of the disk by mass cooler than 30 Kelvin. This low gas temperature is needed to match the temperatures that we derived from our CO observations, uh, particularly of the uh, 12 CO, 2 to 1 shown here, uh, and then the 13 CO, 3 to 2, and 2 to 1, with the background showing the temperature map for our best fit model. 
So because we needed low temperatures to match the temperatures measured from the CO lines, we need a high mass in order to match the HT flux. We also found that this disk is depleted in CO. Uh, so this is a radial profile of the CO depletion in the disk. There is a factor of 10 depletion in the inner disk, um, and then a factor of 10 to 100 depletion in the outer disk. In the model, this is because the CO is being converted into CO2 and methanol ices. And these results are consistent with studies of the radial CO distribution in other protoplanetary disks. So we have this CO depleted disk. It's massive and it's cold. And you might be wondering if it could possibly be stable against gravitational collapse. To check this, we calculated the Tumray Q parameter as a function of radius for the midplane values in our best fit model. This is shown in this plot here. And everywhere in the disk, Tumray Q is greater than one. However, the Tumray Q parameter was derived for a geometrically thin disk, which GM Orega is certainly not. And models have shown that you can actually get instabilities developing for Q less than 1.7 in a geometrically thick disk. And our derived Q value does drop below 1.7 between 70 and 120 AU. This corresponds to one of the bright rings of dust continuum. And this is not a coincidence. Remember that our model includes these concentrations of dust. And the concentration of dust in this radial range lowers the midplane temperature in our model. And it is this low temperature that is driving the low Q value. So is there any actual observational evidence for instabilities in this disk? The most obvious place to look would be in the 12 CO 2 to 1 emission, which shows an abundance of non-axisymmetric features. This is something that was explored in another MAPS paper led by Jane Huang. And uh, there she found that the kinematics of these features are inconsistent with GI, but could be consistent with late stage infall. And indeed, if you look at the 500 micron Herschel emission, there is some residual material in the vicinity of GM Orega. Um, but none of these features are corresponding to the range where we see the possible instability from the tumor Q parameter. However, in a, another uh, paper on GM Orega, this time focusing on the morphology of the millimeter rings, also led by Jane in 2020, they found that this ring at 84 AU appears to be wider along the disk minor axis. This is not an imaging artifact, and the authors conclude it is due to either non axisymmetric structure or to vertical structure in the disk. We don't see any spirals, but there has been work that suggests that the presence of a planet could heat the disk and suppress the spirals. Furthermore, the midplane temperature at these radii is not directly measured from our observations. Um, it is a limit based on our model. So to confirm this region of instability, we need additional analysis both of models of the dynamics in this system, as well as of other lines near the midplane. And this is work that I am currently doing with Alexandra Kuznetsova. So to summarize, as part of the MAPS large program, I have built a thermochemical model to match the emission from HD and 11 transitions of CO. We find a total gas mass of the disk of 0.2 solar masses, a gas to dust ratio of 290. The disk is cold with one to two orders of magnitude depletion. There is possible late stage infall onto the disk and it appears borderline unstable at 80 AU. Thank you.
Uh, so we have some good news. Camber actually wrote to us saying that she managed to connect to Wi-Fi and she is available to take any questions. So if anybody has questions, you can go ahead and raise your hands. Um, so Camber, in, in terms of the GI, uh, which may or may not be relevant, did you check the cooling time criterion? For the, the dust? For, for that region you thought was gravitationally unstable, I'm just, did you look at what the cooling time criterion for fragmentation would be? That's actually not something I've looked into yet. I'll add that up to the, the list of to be done work. Okay. Um, yeah, thank, thank you for the, for the talk. So you mentioned the possibility of having this late infall. Have you been able to measure the m dot over m so the rate so the typical well mass flux compared to the mass of the disks uh, i i mean in, in in other words how many time uh, how much time would it take for the infall to replace entirely the mass of the disk right um so that has not been measured so we see we see these, these spirals and tails in the 12CO that um, could be infall from, from the, uh, the diffuse surrounding material, um, but we don't know for sure that it's infall. Um, and so we don't have a, a rate. Um, I will say just the fact that we don't really see a residual envelope of material and that we only see these sort of non-axisymmetric features at large radii in the 12CO uh, tells us that the rate would have to be fairly low um, just because there's not enough material there for us to observe it. Uh, even in the, the Herschel 500 microns, the immediate vicinity of GM Origa was, was very sparse compared to say SU Origa. Um, looks like there might be a question in the chat as well. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask who is? Um, Arpan, maybe we should just read it out. Yeah, yeah. So, so the question is, what is the significance between the low Q value and the low temperature? Um, and the answer there, if I can, Share my screen. Oh, it worked. All right. Uh, so Q is uh, proportional to the sound speed, which is uh, goes as the square root of the temperature. So if you have a lower temperature, you'll have a lower tumoray Q value, uh, and that's why our our low Q corresponds to a a low temperature. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let's thank our speaker again. Um, so our next speaker is Karina Malko from Universidad de Valparaíso, uh, telling us about the characterization of the dust content in the ring around SC91. So Karina, you can go ahead and share your screen. So uh, first of all, thanks to all the organizers who gave me the honor to present this uh, talk today in this important uh, event, a conference to tribute the career of Lee Harman. So today I will talk about the characterization of the dust content in, in a transitional disk, which is just a, a ring of dust in the constellation of Lupus. So first of all, uh, let me tell you a little story. Uh, so this uh, story went back to uh, 2015, it was one of my first conference as a PhD student, and it was about the origins of the solar system. So, of course, Lee was there, and this is a picture of, of that event. And you can see that Lee is there doing his stuff. And the, the funny fact is that um, I, have one, I was waiting for the, the conference to start, so I was waiting on a chair, and then Lee approached me and he started, you know, uh, asking me these polite questions. How was your trip? When did you get there? Uh, how are you? So we, we chat for a while there. And when Lee uh, leave, uh, the person that was next to me, which is which was and is a uh, well-known uh, astronomer, she looked at me and said like, 
who are you? So that just um, reflects uh, how important and recognized Lee has been for the community. And I immediately uh, recognize that at that moment. So thank you, Lee, for all your work. And I'm honored to be able to interact with you and learn from you and also from Olivia. So getting back to the talk, um, I guess we all now uh, can answer these questions. Why uh, protoplanetary ideas are important? We know that they are the, the natural outcome of a star formation and they basically set the evolution of the system. So um, the protoplanetary ideas structure, as uh, Miriam was telling us previously, uh, basically is this is a sketch of a protoplanetary ideas. And one important thing that you need to take into account when you study protoplanetary ideas is that different wavelength trace different regions in the disk, just as Miriam was telling us. So if you observe this in a scattered infrared light, you will be proving just a surface. And if you look at the submillimeter observations with ALMA, for example, you will look at more deeper layers called mid-plane, where large particles are, uh, because we have this dust settling of the dust, where these small grains will settle to the mid-plane. And that will produce different structures uh, at different uh, wavelengths in, in, the, in the disk. So that is why it is very important to have multi-wavelength observations in order to have a complete image of what is going on in, in protoplanetary disks. So of course, these systems are dynamic, so they are a matter uh, being accreted from the disk to the star in this famous, again, picture from Lee. Um, so that will produce a very interesting process in protoplanetary days because uh, these small dots will be well coupled to the gas, so they will move at two player velocities. But once you have larger particles, these large particles will decouple from the gas and they will move at the player velocity. So this difference in velocity will produce that these large grains lose angular momentum and move uh, through the inner regions in this radial drift. And the problem is that this radial drift seems to be too effective in protoplanetary days. But we know that planets form, we observe them, so we need something that stops the grains in order to, uh, for them to grow. So in that respect, ALMA has been a, a revolution in this, in, in this field. Here I show you again the D-sharp uh, sample, which is high resolution observations at the millimeter of young protoplanetary disks. And you see that, um, as, Nuria, as Miriam was saying, uh, superstructures in this disk are very common. So you see uh, rings, you see gaps, spiral arms. So we, we believe that these are the sites where dust accumulates and grow. So one postulation that has been proposed to explain this is that you don't have this uh, monotonically decreasing distribution of gas, but you have local maxima on the gas, and then the particles will go and will drift to the local maxima and will get trapped there. So if we believe that these uh, superstructures are the result of planet these interactions, so these, these superstructures are basically what you are looking for in order to uh, try to study planet formation and understand how this process um, is produced. So in that uh, case, Schwarz 91 uh, is a very interesting source because it's a transitional disk with a huge cavity. Uh, you can see that the SED here on, on the left is the characteristic um, SED of a transitional disk is a titory star, um, is actively accreting, and is located in the lupus three molecular crowd. So it's around three million years. So it's very young and still. So you can see in the ALM observations that the submillimeter emission is confined to a very narrow ring, and the small dust tracing the surface with infrared observations is peaking inside the millimeter cavity, just as Miriam was uh, pointed out. If you look at the CO, uh, the gas, you can see that the CO is well spread. So all these features. Um, indicates or points to uh, multiple planets in this system um, producing this uh, huge cavity. So uh, for that, we went and observed this source again with ALM observations at a longer wavelength, so 2.1 millimeter. Here I show you the continuing image of that system. You can see that the cavity is really, really big, is 86 AU, is the largest cavity around a single Titari star uh, so far. Uh, and the, the goal here is to use these new observations with archive observations at 0.9 and also 1.3 millimeter to characterize in detail the dust in this system. So we're going to estimate the spectral index and also make a radial analysis of these ALMA multi-wavelength observations uh, with a model that includes a scattering and also optical depth effects that have been pointed out to be. So sorry, so sorry for that, my internet die even though i'm connected with a wire but 
hopefully right now it's I can finish my talk. So sorry for that. I believe I was here when I freeze. So uh, the good thing is that uh, it was just starting the, the analysis. So uh, again, we observe a charge 91, which is a transitional disk with ALMA at different bands. Well, in this, in this case, the new observations at, at 2.1 millimeter, and we're going to combine this with archive data at 0.9 and 1.3 millimeter to characterize the dust and content in these disks. So we're going to do a radial analysis of the ALMA SED, and our model includes scattering effects and also optical depth effects. So here I show you the results from that. So this is uh, the radial intensity profiles at the three data sets that we have. Uh, you see that the, the, the ring of dust is peaking at 90 AU, more or less. And we estimate the spectral index, which is here on the right. So this is spectral index as a function of radius. And you can see that um, the spectral index is almost constant uh, throughout the ring. Um, here I'm only showing the regions from which uh, we expect the, the dust emission to, to emit, so from 60 to 120 AU. So we found an average value for the spectral index of around 3.3. So um, what we did was try to estimate the maximum grain size in the system. First, we did it by the classical approach. So we assume that the emission is optically thin. And doing that, uh, we estimate maximum grain sizes in the order of millimeters, so from 1 to 2.5 millimeters. But given that uh, the emission at ALMA observations uh, can suffer from optical depth effects, and also from scattering, we went and, the, and do a more robust estimate, including all these effects. And this is the results. For the optical depth, for example, here I show you the optical depth as a function of radius. Uh, and you can see that um, our, we found peak optical depth in the range between 0.1 and 0.6 when we include scattering, which is the solid line here for the different bands, uh, which are very similar to the D-sharp sample. Um, and we highlight that uh, if you don't include a scattering, you can underestimate the optical depth. So you can mi misinterpret an optically thick disk with scattering uh, with an optically thin uh, disk. So at least our uh, dose emission is not optically thick, so we can use this data set to estimate properly the, proper, the properties of the, of the dust grains in, this, in the system. So for the maximum grain size and the dust mass here on the right, you can see the profile of the best fit that we found for the maximum grain size. So in this case, the best model is highlighted with this uh, white uh, line. And you can see that the maximum grain size seems to be constant throughout the ring with a, uh, an average value of 0.6 millimeter. And since we can, since we can estimate also the, the, the dust density profiled, we can integrate that profile and obtain a more robust estimate of the mass of solids. So we, we did that and we found that the mass of solids is around 30 air masses. So one thing that we highlighted in this work is that if you assume uh, optically thin emission and, and no scattering, you can underestimate easily the mass of solids in the system and also overestimate the maximum grain size, as you can see here in this comparison. So this can be a solution for the mass bucket problem of for planet formation, where those mass in protoplanetary days that have been estimated in these sumilimeter surveys seem to be too low to explain the observed exoplanetary system. But of course, these masses have been estimated assuming optically thin emission. And we believe now that uh, this is not um, the right assumption, at least not in submillimeter observations in all the cases. So this is something that have to be taken into account when you want to study protoplanetary disks. So putting Schwarz 91 in context and getting back to the spectral index, here I show you uh, the integrated spectral index in this wavelength as a function of the flux at one millimeter. And we compare our estimates for Schwarz 91 with the rest of the population in Lupus. And you can see that Schwarz 91 stands out as a source with the highest spectral index compared to the, the Lupus population. And the, the spectral index have been widely used to estimate grain size because, because it's a proxy uh, for grain size. Basically, if you have lower spectral index, that uh, will imply larger grains. But you have to be careful because as pointed out by Sue 2019, optical depth effects also produce the same outcome. So basically, if, if you have that your emission is optically thick, a millimeter wavelength that will lower your spectral index to values around two. So this scenario can explain this difference because most of the population in lupus is composed of a small 
uh, discs, so compact discs, that are probably optically thick at this wavelength, and that is the reason of their low value of the spectral index. And this is also in line when you compare the TRAS-91 with transitional discs in other regions. So here on the right, I show you the comparison of the spectral index as a function of cavity size for a sample of transitional discs uh, from this sample from Vanilla 2014. And you can see that TRAS-91, uh, the, the red star here, behave as expected for a transitional disk with a huge cavity. It perfectly fits the relationship found in this work. And they explain this relationship because the emission at so many wavelengths are going to be dominated by the dust, where the dust is in the ring. So um, wider cavities means uh, pressure bump further out from the star. So there, the, the maximum grain size is going to be uh, lower. And these small particles will feel a lower radial drift and that would produce that um, uh, turbulent emotions will be the main source of the structural collisions. And in that case, the maximum grain size will also scale with the gas of sensitivity, which decreases with the radial direction. Um, so uh, TRAS-91 being here, the source with the largest cavity, it, it is also expected to have the highest spectral index, as is indeed the case. So it's very important to have into account these uh, processes who want to or um, study the maximum grain size using the spectral index. So how can we interpret our results? Uh, for the optical, uh, big optical data that we found, which are similar to the d uh, sample, uh, there are two possibilities. First, that is an opacity effect as pointed out uh, by Sue 2019. So basically they have optically thick this with lower emission uh, because of scattering. And what they found is that in this particular case, um, here I show you one of the examples from this recent work from Macias of the spectral index as a function of radius for TW Hydra. And you can see that uh, what they also to explain in, in this paper is that if you have um, an inner disk, which is optically thick, you will have that uh, the spectral index there would be around two. And then you will have this sharp transition in the spectral index uh, because of the disc is becoming optically thin with the radial direction. So in this optically thin regimen, now the spectral index, um, you expect it to be at least larger than 2.5. So this morphology of the spectral index is basically set by these different regions where the spectral index is basically um, is produced by different physical mechanisms. And that's something that you also have to take into account when you can interpret the spectral index uh, and their interpretation for the maximum grain size. So even though this explained this uh, case, for our case of Charles 91, which is an extended disk, um, point, point uh, picking at 90 AU, uh, this is not probably the case because it's, this interpretation is only valid at the inner disk where you have very dense uh, regions. So what other options do we have? Uh, the other interpretation is that maybe plantesimal formation is happening in the in the in the ring, and for that we compare uh, the our observational results with this model from Stamler 2019. Uh, it's a 1D model which includes dust growth, fragmentation, and also plantesimal formation, and they do that to explain the second ring of the source HD 163296, which is one of the DSHARP uh, targets. And we want to compare with this uh, particular work because here uh, on the top, you can see the, the dust density distribution from their model. And you can see that they use uh, a model of a disk with a gap at 83 AU. So the ring of dust is picking at 100 AU. So very similar to the location of the ring of Charles 91. And they evolve this with time. OK. Uh, to up, OK, great. Up to 13 million years. Uh, and they can explain this uh, optical peak, peak optical values uh, if they include planetesimal formation. And they do that because if you see here on the top, these are the peak optical depth as a function of, of time. And you can see that when you don't include planetesimal formation, then you expect that this peak optical uh, depth uh, will increase significantly. But once planetesimal formation acts on the system and remove millimeter particles to uh, build up larger grains, larger objects, like planetesimals, then that will lower your optical depth and will keep the optical depth in the observed uh, ranges. So that, that's how can they explain uh, this peak optical depth. And one thing that they also did was look at the spectral index and, and their evolution in time. And you can see that in the bottom. And you can see that after 1 million years, uh, up to 30 million years, which is the this 
curve here, the spectral index seems to flat and to be almost constant throughout the ring. So, and, and around these values from three to 3.5 for the spectral index. So given this uh, similar uh, results that we found in, in also in Charles 91, where we have uh, same peak optical depth and also an spectral index that is almost flat and around the same values, uh, one possibility to explain these observations is that planetism formation, ongoing planetism formation is happening in this grain of dust. And we know that grains are, are getting trapped here and are growing because we found maximum grain size in the order of 0.6 millimeter. And it's pointed out recently also that planetism formation is an extremely robust process in protoplanetary disks once you have centimeter particles, which is might be uh, the case in this, uh, also in this frame. So here I'll leave you with uh, my conclusions. Uh, using multi-wavelength observations, we found uh, that the, the most probable or plausible mechanisms to explain uh, these observations is evidence of grain growth due to the accumulation of millimeter particles in the ring and possible ongoing planetism formation in these joint transitional dates. Now it remains to be tested if ring light accumulations around uh, transitional disks show similar characteristics at the superstructures found in the D sharp disk, as is the case for Charles 91. So thanks, thanks uh, everyone, and thanks Lee. Uh, for his amazing career and his amazing impact in uh, the astronomical community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karina. Um, do we have any questions? Um, okay, go ahead, Lee. So uh, does the could the albedo be changing a lot and affect your, uh, uh, your your spectral index over that range? It's not a big range, I suppose, in, in wavelength. Uh, yeah, the, the wavelength that we used was from 0.9 to 2.1 millimeter. Um, so it's not that wide, but uh, as far as I know, the albedo is most important when um, you suffer from this optical death pack. So when you have an optical thick disk um, and a scattering uh, playing an important role in the system, then your albedo can also uh, play an important role affecting the spectral index. But since we found that our uh, optical depth, um, I mean, the, the emission is probably not optically thick um, and we have also including the scattering, um, I don't think the albedo is that important in changing the spectral index. Uh, but I guess I have to look a little bit more in detail in this, but uh, usually when you have optical thin emission, the albedo is not that important. All right, so let's thank our speaker again. Thank you, okay. Karina. So our next speaker is Claire Davies um, from the University of Exeter, and she also sent us a pre-recorded talk, but not because she's unavailable, but because she said there was a lot of construction near her, her place, so she was afraid that there would be too much noise, and she is online to answer questions. Um, so I'm going to start sharing that. Hello, my name is Claire Davis. I use she, her pronouns, and my talk today is on scattering and sublimation, a multi-scale view of the micron-sized dust in the inclined disk of HD 145718. This is based on a piece of work sharing the same title, which I recently submitted to Munras on behalf of my co-author. This work is primarily based on data obtained as part of GLights, which is the Gemini Large Im Imaging with GPI Herbig Titori survey. There are 44 objects in total in the survey, and these have all previously been classified as Herbig AEB stars or Titori stars. The objects have been imaged in scattered light with the Gemini Planet Imager. Specifically, the observations were conducted in J and H bands, corresponding to around 1.25 or 1.65 microns, respectively. And all the observations were conducted in 2017 or 2018. The data have been fully reduced using an adapted version of the GPI Reduction Pipeline version 1.5. I advise you to check out the paper led by Anna Laws and the forthcoming survey paper by Evan Rich for specific details regarding the reduction. Here's a handful of the most standout J and H band QFI images for the sample. 
The darker regions in these images represent the greatest intensity of photons tracing single scattering events. The name of the target is in the top left of each image alongside the observation date, and the wave band of the observation is given in the lower right corner of each image. As with previous surveys of disks and scattered light, we see a variety of morphologies like rings and gaps, spiral arms, and asymmetric extended emission. Looking in particular at HD145718, from left to right here, we have the total intensity images, q images, and u images, with the top row in J-band and the bottom row in H-band. If you're unfamiliar with these kinds of images, you can think of q images as showing you single scattering events and u images as showing you multiple scattering events. The black circle at the center of each image denotes the size of the coronagraphic mask on the telescope. Any emission within this area is likely dominated by artifacts associated with the imaging technique. Looking at the UFI images on their own, the extension of the emission beyond the coronagraph is limited to the north-south direction. This quadrant style shape that we see is fairly typical of inclined disks. However, the limited extent of the UFI signal means that we can't really glean much more information from this image alone. Looking instead at the QFI images reveals more details. Here, the screen is flashing between the original QFI images and copies, which should help guide your eye to the image features. We see an ellipse oriented north-south, which is offset to the west, i.e. the right of center. These are marked as EJ and EH, respectively. Our H-band image also shows an arc feature, again oriented north-south, situated to the east of the image center. This is marked AH. And the J-band image shows two dark features at roughly the same location as the H-band arc. These are marked DJ1 and DJ2. Taken together, these features indicate that the disk of HD145718 has a major axis position angle close to zero degrees and is observed at a relatively high inclination. And these images provide a much clearer perspective on this disk than has previously been acquired. Here I compare our scattered light image to previously published images reconstructed or modeled from interferometric observations in H-band on the top and at 1.3 millimeters along the bottom. These are the only other images of this disk that exist in the literature. And you can see from the beam sizes and elongations here that the minor axis is unresolved in these previous observations. We therefore uh, had the opportunity to improve upon previous estimates of the orientation and the radial extent of this particular disk. Assuming that the ellipse feature traces the front side of the disk facing the observer and the arc traces the rear side of the disk facing away from the observer, the high inclination of HD145718 also provided us with the opportunity to place constraints on the vertical extent of micron sized grains in the disk. And if we could do this over multiple disc radii or a range of disc radii, we could potentially even constrain the degree of flaring in the scattering surface in the outer disc. This is something that has previously only been possible for discs with concentric rings, otherwise known as gapped or transitional discs, which may have inherently different disc properties to apparently full discs such as HD145718. We employed two methods in our analysis. In the first, we fitted elliptical rings of, to isophotes of surface brightness extracted from the q images. Some examples of these fits are shown here from the H-band image. The blue dots are coordinates extracted from the contour function of matplotlib, and the orange ellipses are the resultant best fit. You can see that the coordinates have gaps in azimuthal angle. This cropping was done to avoid the effect of the coronagraph and to avoid a near vertical section of coordinates on the west side of the image, which I'll come back to later on. The elliptical rings are prescribed using the radius of the semi-major axis of the ellipse, its inclination, the position angle of its major axis, and the height of the disk, which follows the shift from the ellipse center to the image center along the, axis, the minor axis position angle. The expressions here were used to relate the position angle and the height of this shift in RA and DEC. Here shown on screen are the tabulated results for the J-band q image and the H-band q image. The geometry is broadly consistent between the two wave bands with the inclination ranging between 67 and 71 degrees and the position angles close to zero degrees as expected from the apparent north-south elongation we saw in the image. We used the height and the radius of each fit to examine the aspect ratio of the disc and find that the H-band scattering surface has a smaller aspect ratio than that of the J-band. This is consistent with what we'd expect from standard wavelength variations in optical depth, where longer wavelengths penetrate deeper into the disc, but it's really nice to have an apparent measure of this effect. Our values of 0.1 to 0.16 for the aspect ratio are also consistent with the results of Avonhaus et al. from 2018 and Junski et al. from 2016, who used near-infrared scattered light images of six protoplanetary disks with concentric ring features 
to derive scattering surface aspect ratios between 0.09 and 0.25. We also employed the Monte Carlo radiative transfer code TORUS to perform more physically motivated and self-consistent parameterizations of HD145718. Specifically, the circumstellar environment was modeled as a passive centrally irradiated disk with gas density shown here. The model is built on a two-dimensional adaptive mesh refinement grid with R and Z describing the horizontal and vertical distances from the star and the disk midplane respectively. The parameters H gas and sigma gas describe the pressure scale height and the surface density of the gas respectively. We adopt simple radial power laws shown here on screen. For simplicity, we fix P equals one in all our models. And the total disk mass is calculated from the 1.3 millimeter flux reported in Garufi et al 2018, assuming a standard gas to dust ratio of 100 to one. We prescribe the dust content of the disk in two parts. Our small silicate grains populate the full vertical extent of the disk and are prescribed to sublimate at a temperature which depends on the local gas density, according to this expression here. They follow a power law size distribution between a minimum of 0.01 microns and a maximum A max, which is varied between models. And this varies between 0.14 microns and 1.3 microns. As I'll show later, this allows us to control the shape and location of the sublimation rim and the scattering phase function in the disk scattering surface. Our larger silicate grains, which are prescribed to be all one millimeter in size, are restricted to a fraction of the gas scale height to mimic settling. These grains are set to sublimate at a fixed temperature of 1200 Kelvin, as the behavior close to the sublimation rim has not been investigated in depth in the literature. Our large grains dominate the mass budget, providing 96.7% of the dust mass content in our models. For the central star, we adopt an effective temperature of 8,000 Kelvin, roughly corresponding to a spectral type of A5. We re-evaluated the luminosity and the extinction as previous estimates had used faint top epoch photometry. And HD145718 is a known UX ORI and dipper variable with a B minus V color that gets bluer during fainter epochs, suggesting an increase in scattered light contributions during occultation events. We used bright epoch BVRI photometry to re-estimate a luminosity of 14.3 solar luminosities and an AV of 0.89. This fitting process also provided us with the first indication that grains larger than lambda over two pi are present in the inner regions of the disk of HD145718 as consistent values of the luminosity were found when fitting faint epoch photometry with a higher total to selective extinction value of five. The torus modeling introduces a lot of free parameters and there can end up being a number of degeneracies involved when applying full disk models to observations that only probe limited disk regions. For this reason, we complemented our GPI observations with new and archival near infrared interferometry, multiband photometry and infrared spectroscopy. Previously published pioneer and gravity data for the object were retrieved from the archives, and we supplemented these with new longer baseline observations obtained using the Merck X instrument at the Chara Array on Mount Wilson in California. The UV coverages provided by the th three instruments on the different arrays are shown here. We also use SEDBIS to collect archival multiband photometry and infrared spectroscopy and to build our SUD. These in the top left are the model parameters that we find provide the best overall fit to all of our data, and below that is our SED. The dashed line corresponds uh, to our best fit torus model overlaid on the observed SED, while the solid line shows a more face-on version of the same model. The difference between these models highlights that we've got circumstellar occultation of starlight in our best fit model, potentially indicating that our GPI and potentially our near-infrared interferometry measurements were obtained during a fainter epoch. In the center here, you can see our best fit torus q model images flashing to reveal the observed GPI image with contours from the model image overlaid in white. Here you can see the near vertical section to the west of the image center, which I mentioned earlier and I said I'd come back to. This vertical section is related to variations in the scattering phase function with azimuthal angle and is our second piece of evidence which suggests grains in this disk have grown to larger than lambda over two pi. The scattering phase angle is related to the grain size as shown here in this grid of images. These are our torus model images computed with different values of A max where everything else was remained constant. When larger grains are present in the disk surface, you end up with this Pac-Man-like feature in your disk images due to the poor backscattering efficiency of this grain mixture. And our q images suggest grains as large as 0.5 microns are present in the disk surface layers uh, and anything larger has kind of settled below the scattering surface that we observe. Our interferometric observations, which probe the sublimation rim, 
are also sensitive to grain sizes and can provide interesting insights into the settling of larger grains. With minimal settling, i.e. fractional heights up to around 40% of the gas pressure scale height, the disc rim surface follows the shape outlined in purple here, consistent with the case of no settling. The data points in this figure show the depth to which H-band stellar photons penetrate into the disc in our torus models. By settling the larger grains to only 10% of the gas scale height, we get a different structure in the inner rim, which is shown in blue. It still extends down to roughly the same limit between 0.17 and 0.2 AU, but this secondary bump here is controlled by the largest grains in the non-settled grain mixture. And changing our A max then moves this secondary bump closer or further from the star. This here shows the comparison of our best fitting model to the H and K band visibilities. It wasn't possible to provide a better fit to the data within our parameter constraints, i.e. that all circumstellar emission arises from a disk and the inner rim of that disk is controlled by a two component model with settled and non-settled grains. The region that is most poorly fit in these models is the shortest baseline data. So this stuff here and this stuff here. This is probing the most extended emission. And it's previously been suggested that the, inter the immediate drop in visibility at the shortest baselines indicates the presence of extended emission. Even with our two component model, we can't push this emission far enough from the star. It might be possible to improve on this by including either a third component of really small grains, or similarly, a diffuse dusty outflow, such as a photoevaporative wind, which can lift material off the disk surface. Either way, our GPI observations show that this does not dominate the infrared scattering surface on larger tens of AU scales. Going back to our isofoot fitting, we noticed in the tabulated values of fits that there was a slight hint that the scattering surface height increased with the elliptical ring radius. This is our data plotted over the range of disk radio that we probe. The H-band data is shown in green, while the J-band data is shown in purple. We fit the power law relation shown at the bottom of the screen to the data and find that indeed the scattering surface does appear to be flared. Now, just to make this clear, this is not probing the flaring of the gas scale height, which is predicted to have a beta in the range 1.125 to 1.3. The shape of the scattering surface will depend on the flaring of the gas scale height, but also on the radial density distribution of solids. We also used our Taurus model to test our isophote fitting procedure. We used a ray tracing algorithm to identify the tau equals one scattering surface in our best fitting Taurus model, which is shown here by the dashed purple and green lines. And the colors are still the same for the different wave bands. We then redid our isophote fitting using the Taurus model q images. The colored cross crosses mark our best fit values and the shaded area shows the error margin on our power law fit to these data. The black crosshair is a pixel size in the GPI and Taurus images. And what we find is that while the isophote fits recover the height of the disk at its outer edge reasonably well, this is really not the case over smaller disk radii and the discrepancy increases with decreasing radius. Furthermore, we noticed that the inclination gleaned from our isophote fits of the Taurus model images correlated with the surface brightness of the isophote as shown here. Isophotes tracing closer to the disk outer edge appeared less inclined. We can begin to see why this is when we compare the isophote coordinates shown as red dots in these four panels here, the fitted ellipse shown in black, and the ellipses drawn out by the scattering surface recovered from the retracing algorithm at different disk radii. At the low surface brightness level, the isophotes are stretched to the east, likely as a result of us being able to see into the edge of the disk as well as down into the top surface. Meanwhile, at higher surface brightness, the isophotes are squashed to the west, and this is related to the relative backscattering inefficiency we saw earlier. We propose that these issues could be overcome and the isophote fitting procedure could be used to probe the flaring of the scattering surface in similarly inclined, apparently full disks if the inclination can be independently constrained, e.g. by using ALMA. Here I show a summary of our conclusions and I will take questions live. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, does anybody have any questions here in the audience or on Zoom? Lee, go ahead. I think you said this was an, a UXRE object. And it is, yes. And, and so usually uh, people thought of these, you know, not as dippers per se, right? But like, you know, clouds kind of wandering around in front. Is there a lot of stuff? Uh, in the in the general environment, 
Um, so it's been classified as both a UXRE and a DIPA variable. Um, so I'll leave that to the uh, light curve analysts to uncover like what that means. Um, so I think it's got longer timescale and shorter timescale variability. Yeah, um, I mean, that's that's the thing, right? The long timescale thing seems not really consistent with Dipper. Um, yeah, just, just reading from different people's classifications. I think it came out of like the, the K2 analysis um, of Brofuki, the Dipper classification. Let's thank Claire again. Thank you, Claire. And our last speaker before the coffee break is Evgenia Kumpia from the University of Leeds, who will talk to us about the first interferometric survey and K band of massive YSOs. Um, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Um, so first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, I feel really honored uh, to uh, present my results among all of you people. Um, I would like also to thank my collaborators. Um, I'm going to present a work that was recently accepted for publication in ANA. Uh, it should be published uh, soon, I expect maybe uh, next month. Um, I will first uh, give a little bit of introduction in this slide already. I will spend a few minutes to give a bit of background uh, why we're interested in studying uh, massive XLR objects and why K-band is really important to do so, and in particular in, in the ferrometric uh, techniques. Um, so massive stars are really influential objects in the universe. They um, uh, influence uh, the dynamics and, chem and chemistry of galaxies. Uh, yet uh, there are many troubles in understanding how exactly they can perform and become so massive. Um, there is a more and more accumulating evidence in literature that uh, disks play a prominent role uh, similar to the Lomas uh, stars. Um, but this is basically mostly based on uh, um, uh, millimeter observations, ALMA observations, which trace larger scales. Um, so basically here in the background, I saw already uh, a, a sketch of uh, how the disks surround uh, LOMA stars are expected to be. And we see that basically uh, in different wavelengths, you can trace different regions and different also uh, uh, dynamics and uh, uh, physical conditions of the environments of the disks. So basically for millimeter observations, one can trace in the Lomas case, uh, hundreds of AU, basically the outer disk where the uh, main mass reservoir is located. And basically some millimeter um, observations can trace the dust through dust continuum and also molecular rotational lines are very uh, powerful diagnostic uh, lines. Uh, but if one wants to go to the hotter environment of the disk, has to go to shorter wavelengths, uh, mid-infrared observations can trace uh, here. Uh, it becomes more important for planet forming regions and uh, tens of AU. Um, but if one wants to go to the inner rim of the disk, where basically the actual accretion is taking place, the more hot uh, environment, uh, then one has to go to near infrared observations and uh, basically the 2.2 micron uh, emission at the K band uh, is an ideal tracer because it's uh, uh, co-aligned with where the dust sublimation occurs basically for a temperature of 1500. So it's a great um, a wavelength to study the inner rim of uh, the disk and trace uh, scales of uh, AU scales or sub AU even. Of course, for a massive star, this is a scale up version. Um, and here, um, uh, basically we don't uh, know a lot about uh, the high mass star formation, how uh, this inner region looks like. I think we have seen already a lot of the cartoon from Lee uh, in this uh, conference, uh, but this is a picture of low mass stars. I have to remind you, and for high mass, the magnetosphere it doesn't seem to be so prominent. So it's a question, how does it look? And this is the focus of the study. Uh, basically, uh, we wanted to know how the inner rim uh, looks like, where is it located? Um, uh, how the ionized gas is distributed, uh, basically traced with a bracket gamma emission at these wavelengths. And also, in addition, we want to check uh, if binaries can form already at the AU scales. And I'm going to give a separate introduction why we care about binaries a bit later on the talk. 
Um, so, uh, AU scales this around NY souls. Uh, what do we know so far about these scales? Uh, the answer is not so much. Uh, there was a famous example from Krauss et al. in 2010, uh, where uh, he first found an AU scale disk around MRI so and was able to uh, reconstruct an image based on the VLTI observations at 2.2 micron. And then there was a silence of about 10 years. And then there was a, this nice paper from Karate or Karate in Grab Collaboration 2020, uh, where they were the first to resolve also the CO Bathhead emission around uh, a high mass uh, young stellar object. Um, but there is not so much information about K band sizes of uh, MY shows in the literature if one looks. And so we can question ourselves why is that? Is it because they are not interesting objects? And the answer is that they are really difficult, really difficult to observe uh, with these techniques uh, because they are really highly embedded, uh, they are scarce, and they are just not uh, easy to observe. Um, until recently now, uh, I'm going to present uh, some results we have uh, uh, for S6 and Y shows. Um, the goal was to resolve and characterize uh, the 2.2 micron hot dust emission um, and the associated bracket gamma emission, and also to provide the binary statistics uh, as observed uh, with gravity and upper. Basically, we trace scales between 2 and 300 AU. Uh, the sample is uh, six MYSOs, and as I said before, uh, six uh, may sound insignificant number of uh, a sample, but Give this object is really significant and it can help to really advance our understanding of what's happening in this uh, really uh, hot environment uh, in the innermost regions of MY souls. And the data we are using are ABR and gravity on the VLTI. And the main method we are using is uh, uh, geometric modeling. Here on uh, this plot, I saw an example of one of our MYSOs, the G03034. Uh, this is a visibility curve. Uh, this is the visibility over baselines. Um, for people that they are not uh, familiar with interferometric term, I don't want you to panic. It's just basically uh, when a visibility, when a point of the visibility is around one, it means that your, so your source is unresolved. And the lower visibility means that you start resolving your emission. And then it depends on what kind of shape your emission has. Uh, you can also get a different information of uh, if your distribution, the brightness distribution in the sky um, is a ring, for example, or if it's flattened, uh, what is the position angle. If there is a binary, you should be able to see it as well. Um, so here the white points are basically the observations of the 2.2 micron continuum and the blue are the, the models. And from such a modeling, uh, one can uh, constrain what is the size of the emission, as I said before, the spatial distribution, if there's, there are binaries there as well. And the same method we apply for both continuum uh, and also the bracket gamma emission, which was apparent uh, in all the spectra uh, of our sources. And um, so now I... I the first question we would like to address is uh, where is the inner ring located? Uh, basically, what that, that means is uh, how big is your 2.2 micron emission uh, around these uh, MYSOs? And uh, by applying this geometric model, list, I was able to derive the size of uh, all the sources and place them for the first time in a, a size luminosity diagram. Uh, so this is the ring radius, if somebody assumes a, a ring brightness distribution uh, to approximate the 2.2 uh, micron emission over luminosity of the source. And uh, the shaded curves are basically uh, what is the dust sublimation radius predicted from different uh, disk models, from classical uh, disk model to optical thing with or not uh, back warming effects. And here I overplot also something that was known before from the literature uh, from uh, Milan Capet already in 2007, uh, basically placing uh, Titoris and Herbix in this diagram. Uh, we already see them scale and with a square root of the luminosity. 
And here is the, the new information. Uh, that's something that it's the first time uh, we were able to do with the study to place direct measurements of the K-band emission of uh, MY shows. These are the green dot uh, solid uh, dots. Um, I also have uploaded uh, the two available from literature, but also the open circles are ones from a very nice study from uh, Frost et al. 2021. Uh, who were able to derive sizes based on uh, uh, models. So they are not direct measurements, but they are basically measurements uh, that were derived from um, mid-infrared modeling observations together with SED. Um, so what we see from, from this plot is that it doesn't matter um, if you're a low, uh, intermediate or high mass object, it seems that your inner radius is going to scale with the square root of uh, luminosity, um, which I think it's a very nice uh, confirmation. Moving on, uh, where is the bracket gamma emission located? Um, so basically, I we were interested to see since our objects saw bracket gamma emission to see um, if the ionized gas uh, can tell us something about processes that take uh, place, uh, what kind of accretion or accretion or rejection process take place around those uh, objects. And uh, I apply the same geometrical model similar as I saw before for the continuum for the bracket gamma emission. And then I was able to derive the, uh, the size of the bracket gamma emission. Here I plot the uh, radius of the bracket gamma uh, over the continuum and over the luminosity. And basically what I want you to take out of this is that uh, they are significantly, the bracket gamma emission uh, originates uh, systematically from a region inwards from the dust. So basically you have the dust sublimation region and then uh, the bracket gamma comes from a more compact region. And from um, the other interferometric observables of, uh, that I had in hand, I could also derive that not only it's more compact, but also it's special to the continuum. And although we didn't, unfortunately, we didn't have the kinematic information because our spectral resolution was not high enough in order to do kinematic models, uh, this information, the special information by itself can hit towards um, a, an origin of the bracket gamma emission in the base of a jet or a disk wind uh, from the gaseous disk. Um, which is also very nice because, uh, as I said before, we don't have such information. Such information is not uh, very common for massively accelerated objects. Uh, to, uh, the last part of the uh, talk is going to focus on massive binaries, uh, young massive binaries, and if they can form already at AU scales that we were able to trace with uh, gravity and other. So I'm moving to the introduction of binarity a little bit. So why do we care? Um, they do have a significant influence on high mass star formation and evolution. Um, studies have found more and more that massive stars are found to be in binaries, uh, more than 80%, as high as 100% uh, when it comes to uh, main sequence uh, stars. Um, and, but observation statistics of young massive stars uh, are lacking and therefore, uh, they are really necessary if one wants to distinguish and inform also the several binary formation theories that they are in their literature, trying to understand how uh, massive stars come to become binaries. Uh, what kind of techniques one can use in order to actually trace uh, the binarity on young massive stars? Um, there are several techniques and the, every technique is going to trace different scales. Uh, so it's very important to have a combination of techniques if somebody wants to get the entire picture of what's happening, what's happening with binarity. Uh, we have the adaptive optic imaging, uh, basically visual binaries at wide separations, uh, hundreds of AU uh, to thousands of AU. Uh, recent study, that was the most recent study was, uh, and the only study targeting NY souls in K-band with this technique was from Pomohatsi 2019. And I encourage you to see also the poster from uh, Robert uh, Santon. Two minutes. And we have a long baseline deferometry, uh, which can trace closed binaries at A scales. And this is where my part comes because I'm doing a deferometry. 
and I'm trying to understand this uh, range of separations. Uh, here we don't have uh, so many objects either. I, we only have serendipitous uh, discoveries. Uh, again, a famous object from Kraus 2016, uh, which we saw a very mass protobinary at 170 AU scales. And then there was also a study by me in 2019 uh, that we found binaries, uh, the first binaries that they were separations less than 100 AU. Then we have also spectros spectroscopy where more compact binaries can be uh, traced and at sub AU scales. As I said before, all these techniques are really necessary if one wants to fill the gaps uh, in the parameter space and get proper information on the young massive binary fraction. Uh, so now I'm going to uh, reply on the question before, how many binaries do we see forming in the AU scales that uh, I'm tracing with the ferrometry? The answer is not so many. So only one out of six objects were found to have binary signatures. Uh, here, I saw the binary fraction over different uh, stages of evolution of massive stars, uh, embedded phase where the MYSOs are, uh, pre-main sequence phase of Yago LBs, uh, which is based on a gravity collaboration in 2018. And then we have the main sequence OB stars and um, from Sun et al. And I think something that becomes really apparent from this uh, plot already is that although the uh, pre-main sequence phase and embedded phase, you can say that they are comparable, uh, the statistics are comparable, we see an increase um, in the main sequence. And this can hit that maybe something happens uh, dynamically in the evolution and you get more binaries as uh, the systems evolve. Um, also, if I compare this result here with the MYSOs uh, presented in Tomohatsu's work, um, we found that they are like um, very similar uh, and within the error bars. So basically this uh, suggests a flat binary fraction uh, between AU scales of 2AU up to 10 thousands of AU that the binary fraction in this phase is uh, uh, low, like about 30%. Um, and yes, I, I would like to uh, uh, give you my conclusions now. So basically, uh, we specially resolve the crucial star disk interface in a sample of uh, MYSOs in the K band. And we finally confirm observationally the prominence of AU scale disks uh, in high mass star formation. Um, then uh, it doesn't matter if uh, you are a low mass titori, a herbic, or MYSO, uh, it seems that your inner radius of the disk uh, is going to follow a universal thread and the sizes are going to scale with the square root of uh, the stellar luminosity. The Brackenham emission is overall more compact in size with, this, with respect to the thermal emitting dusty region and um, the fact that they are also specially aligned a point towards the disk wind accretion uh, scenario. And the observed fraction of the universal binaries in K-Bad is almost flat for a very wide range of separations between 2 AU to 10,000 of AU. And they are seemingly uh, less common than massive main sequence stars on uh, similar scales uh, found in, uh, from other studies. And thank you very much. Thank you, Evgenia. So um, I see that Hans has his hand raised on Zoom. Would you like to ask a question, Hans? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. About the binaries. My, my question is, is the sample perhaps still too small to, to say much about this uh, the binary frequency at those AU separations? I mean, it could be that, that binaries, massive binaries, they form by migration of the companion for in, inwards and, and then only at the later stage, the binary frequency is very high because it's most, it's highest for the most compact binary configurations for the spectroscopic binaries as, as Huxana and others have, have uh, um, found. But I think the, the binary frequency is probably not Uh, strongly constrained by, by your observations. So I encourage you to take, to do more um, observations. And, and uh, also my question you. is, what mass ratio do you probe? 
Uh, yes, so thank you very much for the comment. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, our sample is very small. Um, and that's why also the large error bar in our uh, study compared to SANA, for example, which has hundreds of objects. Um, this is something that I expect to be improved in the future with Gravity Plus because uh, the sensitivity limits are going to be pushed really, and then we are going to be able really to observe uh, many more objects. We will, are going to be able to observe like uh, order of magnitude more objects uh, than what we are capable of doing now. Um, I have to stress indeed that this is like the absolutely best we can do at the moment with uh, interferometric observations with uh, MYSOs, only because they're just not bright enough in K-band and they cannot it just yeah <laughs> we cannot trace them that's it um i think uh, indeed we cannot put a, a strong constraint at the moment i think it's something to look at something that can uh, trigger the curiosity and something for sure to investigate in future studies also with uh, different filters as well which uh, can be used in order to indeed uh, get rid of uh, observational biases uh, not only with a k band but also with h band um, this can also help to constrain the mass ratios better as well. So at the moment, I can say that the delta K uh, magnitude difference we can trace up to five. Uh, basically, theoretically, we would see uh, uh, subsolar companions if they are there. Um, mm -hmm. The studies, all the studies that I plot here, have a comparable sensitivity of what is your mass ratio you are able to trace. Uh, something which is different is that these two are uh, based on K-band observations, while SANA was based on H-band observations, and this already can uh, trigger a little bit of bias there of uh, if we are missing something because we don't have the H-band observations. So the next uh, immediate objective, I would say, is to trace these objects also in the H-band, and then in the future when uh, K-band becomes uh, uh, more advanced, the observation can become more advanced and we can get a uh, larger samples as well and uh, track it. Thank you. Thank you. I just also would like to point out a study by Daniel Apai where they do infrared observations, spectroscopic observations to yeah. find the even closer binaries. It's like a monitoring pro uh, project where you take spectra at uh, sort of random intervals and you find radial velocity uh, variables in the in the infrared and so this is also uh, an avenue that should be pursued yeah absolutely and this is something also uh, that is pursued here in Leeds as well with uh, we have like exuter spectroscopic service going on uh, to trace uh, uh, variations in the radial velocities in the even get the spectroscopic binaries uh, from a pi work as well I want to point out that indeed they also find the report from 2007, I think, uh, a binary fraction of 12% only. So it's, again, a uh, very small percentage there when you go to, to young binaries. But, but it's consistent with a higher fraction. It's not, it's just a lower limit. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Evgenia. I think, uh, unfortunately, we have, to, okay, we have one question here from Nuria. Like a shorter wavelength information on, on lines, hydrogen lines, uh, for those objects that you have, like gamma, like H alpha, just to see the line profiles. Um, oh, they are too embedded. <laughs> so no, I, I only can show you a bracket gamma profile. It's a narrow profile. We don't see any uh, P signal or inverse P signal, but also our spectral resolution is very uh, low. So it's uh, we can trace. Uh, um, I think 700 kilometers per second. So any kinematic, interesting kinematic that could uh, hit to a jet origin, for example, or a really this wind, it's something we cannot really trace because then you need at least 100 kilometers per second resolution. Thank you. One more quick question, Nevgena. Uh, what about intentions of going to longer wavelengths? I mean, uh, for those deeply embedded objects, uh, Matisse would be uh, also, uh, I think, well suited to uh, uh, investigate the, the binary uh, statistics and so on. Any intention to do that? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, Matisse could be a very good extension to uh, studies as Pole et al, for example, that they had media observations, so it would be really great to have imaging in the M-band uh, as well. Uh, in M-band, it would be great to see circumbinary environment, for example, there are circumstellar disks combined with circumbinary disks, and then we can distinguish if there is a coplanarity as well there. Um, I wouldn't go to M bad to really trace binarity as binarity because you really want to be sure that you trace the photosphere and be sure that what you trace is really a, a binary system instead of just the disks. Um, but the combination of all the information, I have it here as well, actually, in the future direction, they have time to talk about it, I think. But uh, I think uh, the multi wavelength studies, combination of H band, K band, M band, that will be really powerful tool to. Uh, for binary disks, for everything, really. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you very much, Evgenia. Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. It is my great pleasure to talk about spirals induced by planets and self-gravity in this conference to honor Lee. I did my PhD thesis with Lee at University of Michigan. During my early study, this book is very valuable to me. I almost read every single word in this book. So this is Lee's illustration for accretion disks through viscous stress, through magnetic rotation instability, and through self-gravity. So the spirals connect different parts of the disks um, through self-gravity. This is my earliest understanding of spirals in disks. My thesis topic is about FU Ori outbursts originally, um, but during that time, uh, Nuria and Catherine S. Pilot had many wonderful observations on transitional disks. So Lee talked to me and said, um, maybe we need to connect observations uh, with theory. And there are a bunch of theorists at Cambridge uh, in this conference, the dynamics of disks and planets. And let's go to this conference and talk to them and build a theoretical model to explain these observations. So we went to that conference, then I talked with Richard Nielsen and worked with him and carried out these simulations trying to explain these observations. Uh, it turns out there is a strong tension between the equation rate of transitional disks and the dust depletion at the inner disk. So the high equation rate means they have a lot of gas in the disks, but the near infrared deficit suggests there is no dust. So apparently there is something we don't understand about the dust and gas dynamics in the disk. So I think I should know more theory. Um, so I went to Princeton and working on planet interaction, and I learned all about dust dynamics, MRI, thermodynamics, and then I talked to Lee, and I'm pretty proud. I know a lot about theories now. And then Lee told me, um, you should think about connect theory with observations. So that was the time when Lee suggested we could have a project uh, at his, this ICIMA conference in Beijing. And Lee proposed the project to translate some of my simulations into observational images. So that was a student project. The student who picked this project was Robin Dong, a graduate student um, at Princeton University. So I think this project also shaped Robin's career um, in the future. And we come up with this dust filtration uh, idea to explain the dust and gas decouple in the disks. So working with Lee, I learned that if you are an observer, you need to think about theory. If you are a theorist, you need to think about observations. So now let me discuss this story of spirals with both observation and the theory. So spirals uh, actually for, were first discovered in the spiral galaxies. So this is a whirlpool galaxy. And this is actually the discovery image of this whirlpool galaxy. Okay, so this is the first spiral documented. It's a sketch uh, by Lord Ross at 1845. 
And now we know the spirals exist in protoplanetary disks, and also at a smaller scale, they even exist in Saturn's rings. Thanks to AMA and the ground-based um, telescopes, we have a lot of disks with spirals. So these are the spirals collected from the literature. So in some disks, we have um, many spiral arms, like these two cases. And in some disks, we only have two spirals. And in some cases, we only have a single spiral. So we have a variety of spirals. So how to explain these spirals? Um, the spirals are explained by the density wave theory. I'm definitely not a person to summarize the density wave theory. Um, Frank Xu actually has an annual review article on six decades of the spiral density wave theory. So in my talk, I will only focus on the morphology of the spirals. So why spirals are common in astrophysical disks? Uh, because the wave will propagate in a disk in the spiral form. Okay, so for a system which is not rotating, if you perturb this fluid, the fluid will excite a spherical wave. Right. So it's like a pebble dropped in a, um, a pond, and it will excite these uh, spherical waves. But in a rotating system, Keplerian rotating system, if you perturb the disks, the, propagation will, the perturbation will propagate in the spiral form. Okay. So we have four perturbations here, and everyone is becoming a spiral and also advected by the Keplerian flow. Okay, orbiting around the central star. So we see spirals in disks simply because the wave propagates in the disks are in the spiral form. Okay. So in my talk, I'll first discuss how the spirals can be excited by perturbers, for example, planets in protoplanet disks. Then I'll discuss how spirals can be excited in self-gravitating disks. Okay. So from a linear theory, um, the spirals are basically sound waves. So the pitch angle of the spirals are related to the sound speed. So the tangent of the pitch angle of a spiral is simply the speed in the radial direction, which is the sound speed, divided by the shear in the azimuthal direction, which is omega minus omega p. Okay. So the pitch angle is related to the sound speed. When the disk gets hotter, when h o bar gets larger, the spirals opens up. So with the linear theory, um, if we know the perturbance position, we can use these spirals to estimate the disk temperature. Okay. But this, this simple theory um, could not explain uh, many things. Um, the real theory on the spiral is more complicated. For example, if you look at the spirals at the inner spiral, you can notice this inner spiral actually disappeared after propagating a while, while there is another spiral appeared outside the original spiral. Um, so these are the secondary spirals, um, which has been studied by J. Han, um, and we explain it with some analytical theory also. So these secondary spirals are very weak, um, but they are very important dynamically. Uh, this is because every spiral, when they propagate in the disks, they will eventually steepen to shocks. So if you have a low mass planet in the disks, this low mass planet will excite two primary spiral. These two primary spiral will become shock at these two positions, uh, two radii. But the secondary spiral, which are a lot uh, weaker, um, they will propagate much further in towards the central star, and they will steep into shocks at the very small radii. So eventually, you have three shock fronts uh, excited by this single planet. And then the shock will transport angular momentum from the wave to the disk. And eventually, a single planet could open multiple gaps in the disk. And it, if you increase the planet mass, um, you could even excite tertiary spirals, and these tertiary spirals will also become a shock 
and eventually you produce four gaps by a single planet. Okay, so a single planet could excite multiple spark, uh, multiple gaps, and using these gap positions, uh, we could estimate um, the perturbation mass. So one of the most ex one of the best examples of multiple gaps induced by a single planet could be the AS209. So this is D sharp observation for AS209. And we have observed many gaps, at least um, six or seven gaps, and many rings, like um, six rings in this single system. Um, and then by placing a planet, 0.3 Saturn mass planet at 100, 100 AU, a single planet at 100 AU, we are able to reproduce at least five rings and five gaps. Okay, so the blue curve here is from observation, and orange curve here is from numerical simulations with a single planet at 100 AU. So we successfully reproduced this uh, horseshoe region, and this is a secondary gap, and even two gaps further in. So this is a demonstration that the wave become shock theory uh, could be used to explain observations. And with all the D-sharp uh, gaps, uh, we could probe the potential planet population uh, using these uh, gaps. Among all the D-sharp gaps, um, we find there is only one source uh, could have a planet mass larger than 5 Jupiter mass. So the occurrence rate for very massive planets um, could be very low. Um, it's actually just 6%, which is consistent with direct imaging techniques. On the other hand, we find a large population of Neptune to Jupiter mass planets beyond 5 to 10 AU. And this is not very surprising considering our solar system have Uranus and Neptune in this parameter uh, space. Okay. Um, so now we get back to the spirals. Um, we talk about the spiral can step into shock. And when the planet mass gets larger, uh, this shock will also become stronger. And the shock will propagate in the disk at very high speed. Um, it will be faster than the sun's speed. So when the planet mass increases, the shock gets stronger, and it propagates faster, and the pitch angle will increase. And also the secondary spiral uh, will also become more apparent and separated from the primary spiral. So in this case, these two spirals form this m equals 2 mode spiral. And amplitude will also become stronger. So theoretically, we could use these spirals, the pitch angle and the separation between these two spirals to estimate the planet mass. And this is what we did uh, for MWC758. Um, this is motivated by the Swirlpool galaxy so we suggest, oh, maybe there is a giant planet at outer disks. The planet is so massive, so that these two spirals are highly nonlinear, and they form this m equals two uh, pattern. So this planet is in interaction model got some support uh, observationally. Um, the first is the pattern speed of these spirals is very small. So. For planet excited spirals, these spirals will co-rotate with the planet. So the pattern will move at the same pattern speed as the planet's orbital speed. So if the planet is inside this cavity, inside the inner cavity at 30 AU, then over 10 years observational period, uh, the spirals will rotate 30 degree. But if the planet is at outer disks, for example, at 150 AU, then over 10 years, these spirals will move just 3 degrees. And observations take, have been taken several years apart, and the spirals hardly move. And the best constrained model is that the perturber is some more than 100 AU, uh, somewhere here, kind of a support or outer perturber um, scenario. And uh, this single perturber excite two arm scenario or get uh, some support from the binary observations. So in the HD10453 systems, there is a companion, 0.2 solar mass companion, uh, far away from the primary star. And uh, there are two spirals around this primary star. And by carrying out simulations, 
we could successfully reproduce these observations um, using the two spirals excited by the companion. So that's another uh, support. However, um, there are several inconsistency between observations and this theory. Okay. So the first inconsistency is that um, there is no companions has been found or confirmed in the outer disk. Okay. There are many uh, observation attempts to find these perturbers, uh, both for the inner disk and for the outer disks. And this is a recent sphere observation, very deep observation, um, but they have not found any perturbers in this system. So maybe this is due to a flyby. Maybe the perturber already has left the systems. So Jeremy Smallwood, um, uh, who was a graduate student at UNOV here, he carried out a SPH simulation to simulate what will happen if you have a flyby event. And indeed, with a flyby event, you could excite this m equals 2 spiral. But these spirals won't last long. Just after several thousand years, these spirals will propagate to the inner disk and eventually dissipate it. Okay. So if you see the spirals uh, in these systems, you know that the perturber hasn't left uh, the system uh, far away. So you could search the surroundings around the primary star. And with Gaia observations, we have searched the regions around MWC758, and we have not found any candidate which could be a, a recent um, perturber or fly from a flyby event. Okay. So no companions have been found. Um, the second uh, inconsistency is that uh, a lot of these spirals have pitch angles very different from the planet is interaction. Okay. For example, TW Hydra uh, show very tight spiral. Um, so the spiral from the CO observation has very small pitch angle. It's less than almost five degree for this for the this spiral and this spiral. So such small pitch angles um, can only be excited if this if the perturber is at very inner disk or very outer disk. Um, but if that is the case, the spirals should be relatively weak. We should not see spirals um, in a lot of cases. Um, and in some other cases, like HD 3, 4, uh, 700, um, in this case, the spirals is very open. The pitch angle could be 20 to 30 degree. Um, if this, these spirals are induced by a, a planet, um, the planet should be very close to these spirals and should be very massive. Um, so we should see them, but we haven't. So this is the second inconsistency that the pitch angles in observations varies greatly. Um, the third inconsistency is that different spirals in one system seem to have different pattern speed. So this is HD135344, and these two spirals, S1 and S2, um, seems to rotate around the central star at different speed. Okay, so over just one year apart, this S1 spiral seems to change uh, more than the S2 spiral, which almost have not changed at all. Okay, so if it's a circular orbiting uh, perturber, the both of the spirals should co-rotate uh, with the with the perturber. Okay, so. How to reconcile these inconsistencies? Here we propose that these spirals may be excited by eccentric perturber. So this work um, is done with the Raymond Zhang. Uh, Raymond is actually a high school student here at Vegas. And he did a summer project with me. Um, and we explained the spirals excited by ex eccentric perturbers using a simple analytic theory. So before I talk about the theory, uh, let me first show you some simulations on the spirals excited by eccentric perturbers. So here we have an eccentric perturber, uh, and this is in a rotating, co-rotating frame. So the perturber will only move left and right. Um, so you can see that the perturber excites spirals, and this spiral now detach from the perturber, and this is actually the outer spiral. 
So the outer spiral could actually be inside the planet's orbit. And these two spirals could separate from each other. And sometimes they are connected with this, uh, some additional spiral. Um, and the spirals could actually like, bifurcate and merge. Um, um, and even like cross each other. Very complicated. If the perturber has a higher eccentricity uh, here, um, you can see the spirals are more complicated. Okay. So two spirals. Um, sometimes the spirals like, bifurcate across each other. And you have many, many spirals excited by this single perturber. So one of the key things on the spirals excited by eccentric perturber is that the spirals are never steady. Uh, no matter which frame you are on, uh, the perturber is always moving left and right. So the spirals are not steady. Okay. So this makes studying them even more complicated. Um, but we came up with uh, a theory to explain it, um, to explain these spirals which could detach from the planet. They could detach each from each other. Um, the spiral could bifurcate, and the spirals could uh, cross each other. Okay, so let me show our analytical theory. So our analytical theory are plotted with this green and the cyan dots. So the cyan dots represent the inner spiral and the green dots represent the outer spiral from the analytical theory. So the analytical theory traces these uh, spirals very well. Um, have these uh, bifurcating spirals. They also reproduce these uh, uh, crossing spirals. Spirals cross each other. Yeah, so uh, let me briefly explain how we did, for, uh, what we did for this NNU theory. Um, so we are motivated by the Huygens principle uh, for, for light waves. So for a light wave, um, you could separate the wavefront with a lot of uh, daughter wavelets, and each wavelet will emit a lot of uh, new waves. And the envelope of these uh, wavefront um, becomes the new wave front of the of the originally light wave okay and uh, this is also similar to the Mach comb uh, when you have an airplane flying at a supersonic speed and uh, so the airplanes excite a lot of waves during its flight and these waves will propagate um, in the atmosphere and form this spherical uh, wave pattern and the envelope of these waves form the wake of the airplane so when a perturber is moving around the central star in an elliptical orbit, it will emit these wavelets all the time during the orbit. So after the wavelet is emitted, uh, they will propagate in the disks um, following the spiral arm uh, while they orbit around the central star. Okay. So we could analytically calculate where this wavelet is after it's e emitted and how they propagate in the time, with time. So at time t2, we could calculate there where this wavelet emitted at t1 is. And if we calculate the wavelets, all the wavelets' current position after these wavelets emitted earlier, and connect all of these wavelets together, we could know where the spiral is. So this is illustrated here. The upper panel shows the spiral excited by its eccentric planet at time t equals the planet's orbital time. And it's plotted in the polar coordinates. So this is theta, this is r. And the bottom panel here shows the planet's radial position with time. And since the planet is in eccentric orbit, so it moves in and moves out. So after a wavelet is emitted, like for example at the beginning here, this wavelet will propagate in the radial direction 
at the sound speed. So it follows a straight line here. It's propagated inwards with time. And then at the time t equals t orbit, the wavelet is at position A. So A is where this um, spiral starts. And uh, normally, uh, the wave, when the wavelet emitted later, the wavelet will be at the outer part of the spiral. Um, so it will go in out. But because the planet is in eccentric orbit, at some point, the planet's radio speed will equal the disk sound speed. So this will be a turning point for the spiral. After this point, the wavelets that are emitted later will catch the wavelets emitted earlier. So they will be inside um, the, where the earlier wavelets. So the spiral make a turn and moves in. And eventually at another turning point, um, when the sound speed equals the planet's radio speed, then the wavelet will go in out and another turning point. Okay. So this turning point of the spiral corresponds to when the wavelet was emitted at a time when the planet's radio speed equals the sound speed. So we could measure all the pitch angle and the pattern speeds of all the spirals. Um, for the eccentric equal 0.25 case, we have identified five spirals uh, in these systems, and we measured their pitch angles. And the pitch angles is very different from the pitch angle of the spiral from a circularly orbiting planets, which is this uh, black curve here. So you can see that these pitch angles could be smaller than the circular case or could be larger than the circular case. And uh, with higher eccentricity, um, we have more spirals in the systems. We have seven spirals in these systems now. And some have very high pitch angle, some have very low pitch angle. And if we just pick one radius, like for example, r equals 0.6, then we could calculate the pattern speed of these spirals. And we see the pattern speed of these spirals can vary greatly from 0.2 um, to 1.4i. For these two spirals, there's a green spiral and this cyan uh, spiral. And the blue curve here is from the analytical theory. So you can see the analytical theory kind of reproduce these uh, measured pattern speed very well. So overall, uh, with an eccentric perturber, um, we could excite multiple spirals. And uh, these spirals could have a variety of shapes. Some could even cross each other. Some could bifurcate. Some can detach from the perturber. And uh, every spiral have a different pitch angle. And even during one spiral, the pattern speed is different at different radius. So um, this could potentially explain a lot of inconsistencies between observations and the spirals excited by a circular orbiting uh, perturber. So now I want to talk about the spirals exciting self-gravitating disks. Um, these spirals have been studied before. Um, with these are uh, with SPH simulations. And people find that the pitch angle of the spirals in self-gravitating disks um, do not depend on the cooling time of the disk. But they depend on the disk to star mass ratio or the disk mass. Um, the more massive the disk is, the spirals has a smaller pitch angle. And uh, the number of spirals also depends on the disk mass. When the disk mass is high, the number of those spirals um, gets smaller, reduces. So overall, the pitch angle excited by the self-gravitating disks is around 10 to 15 degree. And uh, this number gets larger when the disk is more massive, or the number of spirals is smaller when the disk is more massive. Yep. But all of these are about gaseous spirals. Um, so with my postdoc, Hans Bayer, we have studied the spirals in the dusty disk, or how the spiral looks like um, for dust. So we carried out 3D uh, shrimp box simulations with self-gravity um, and also particles. We find that if we consider the aerodynamic drag between dust and gas, this dust could uh, follow the spirals when these dust are very small, 
they couple with the gas perfectly, they follow the gaseous spiral. But for the bigger particles, uh, the drag force is weak, and they then they do not follow the spirals. Um, there is no features for very big particles. On the other hand, uh, if we consider that this dust not only fuels aerodynamic drag uh, from the gas, but they also fuse the gas gravity. Right, these gaseous spirals are very massive, um, so they could gravitationally attract these particles. And then in this case, particles, no matter what sizes they are, they all trapped in the spirals. And then from order magnitude estimate, uh, we could calculate what's the drag force, um, and we could calculate what's the gravitational force from the gas to particle. And eventually, we can calculate the ratio between the drag force to the gravitational force. And uh, this is proportional roughly around the tumor Q over Stokes number. So when the particles are very small, um, then the drag force dominates. Okay. The particle follow the spiral. But when the particles are large, and when the Stokes number larger than Q, then the gravitational force starts to dominate and could still attract particles in the spirals. So the bottom line here is that all sized particles can be trapped in these spirals. And these spirals could also help to solve a mystery um, recently revealed by AMA observation of atrial tau. Uh, if we assume this equation rate also stands at 100 AU, we can calculate the alpha parameter for accretion is around 0.01. But our observation suggests that the rings are very symmetric. It means the ring is very thin. So the dust is highly settled. At 100 AU, the dusty disk uh, for millimeter particle is less than 1 AU. And you can translate this to an alpha parameter, the turbulent strength um, for stirring particles vertically. Then the alpha parameter then is 3 times 10 to the 4. Okay. So there is a roughly 2 order magnitude difference or inconsistency between the alpha for accretion and the alpha for disturbing the disk. So the solution to this problem is that maybe the turbulence in this disk is very weak, but somehow the disk can accrete in some non-turbulent way. One popular idea is that this disk accretes through the surface while have a laminar mid-plane um, so not turbulent mid-plane particle can settle, while the disk accretes through the surface, um, probably through the magnetic centrifugal wind. Um, but another idea we think it can work uh, is that maybe the disk is indeed accrete through the mid-plane, but by these spirals, gravitating spirals. So as we learned in Lee's book, the spirals can transport angular momentum and can lead to accretion. So we look at our simulation and we find that the dust is indeed highly settled in these spirals, while the spirals transport a large amount of angular momentum. So more than 90% of accretion in self-gravitating disk is seems to uh, from the spiral, um, from the uh, gravitational torque, only less than 10% is through this turbulence. And furthermore, the vertical gravity from the gaseous disk is very strong in these uh, self-gravitating disks. And this vertical gravity can squeeze the dust disk even thinner. Um, so eventually, if we measure the alpha for accretion and alpha for settling, then the ratio between them can be 100. Okay. So the disk could accrete at very high rate while make the dusty disk very thin. So this could potentially explain this atrial tau uh, puzzle. And uh, um, so gravity unstable disk can drive accretion while maintaining a thin dusty disk. Um, and since these particles are highly settled at the mid-plane at the spirals, and they can concentrate in the spirals, it means at these spirals, the dust um, to gas mass ratio can be very high. This dust can actually collapse and form planets directly. Uh, so in our recent, uh, in our preparing work, we measure these clumps mass, and it turns out that these gravitationally bound clumps can be very massive. In some cases, um, it can even reach to 10 Earth mass. So planets 
could form directly uh, in these spirals. Okay, so planets can form very, very early when the DC is gravity unstable. Um, here we are not talking about giant planet formation, but talking about these planetary cores, dusty cores, uh, with 10 Earth mass, and potentially they can explain all the spirals, uh, all the structures we observe in protoplanetary disks. Okay. So to summarize the talk, uh, we have seen a lot of spirals, um, and if you look at all of the spirals, and look at these observations, look at these disks at other wavelength band, um, you find a lot of these spirals corresponds to um, this uh, large-scale asymmetry, um, so what causes these spirals and symmetry? Maybe they are perturbers, uh, maybe they are GI spirals, maybe both, or maybe neither. So to summarize the talk, um, the lesson from Lee is that we need to connect observations with theory. And for spirals, I talk about two different mechanisms to excite spirals, one by perturber, but there are some discrepancies between theory and observation, and I describe another theory on spirals excited by eccentric perturbers. Um, and finally, I talk about spirals in GI disks. Uh, different from the other spirals, these spirals are very massive, so we need to include the spiral's gravity to dust particles. Um, so dust can concentrate it in these GI spirals due to the, the spiral's gravity. And these spirals can transport angular momentum while maintaining dust highly settled and the dust will be highly concentrated in these spirals and planets can form directly in these spirals. Okay, planets can form early. And finally, I want to thank Lee. If you have any questions, please post them on Slack. Um, I'll answer them in the morning. Okay, thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Shang Jia and I'm a PhD student at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And today I'd like to talk about a paper on self-consistent ring model in protoplanetary disks. And you can find the link of the paper here. The motivation of this paper is that in recent years, we have seen many protoplanetary disks observed in very high resolutions uh, from different surveys and also individual observations. And we, we see that rings are the most common substructures but there is no self-consistence model yet. So we would like to build one. We have assumption, which is that rings are due to the pressure bump. The pressure bump can be due to the planet, MHC winds, photo evaporative flows, zonal flows, mass pile up at the boundary between magnetically active and diet zones, or spontaneous ring formation due to reducing accretion by concentrated dust, and so on. We also want to know that there are also other mechanisms such as dust evolution near snow lines can also produce rings without a pressure bump. So they are not applicable in our model here. So we would like to introduce a model from the simple one. We first build a one population model with a single Gaussian ring at 70 AU. We calculate the temperature using red MC 3D and then we iterate the vertical temp uh, density to balance the vertical hydrostatic equilibrium. And then we calculate the temperature again and iterate it back and forth for several times until the temperature is converged. We also have two population models. In the two population model, we have the small green components and big green component. For the small green component, the profile follows the gas and for the big green component, it has a narrow ring and uh, it is more settled to the mid plane. This is due to uh, the disk has some turbulence and also the dust will drift in the disk. And how concentrated the big ring is, is determined by this Psi parameter, which is proportional to the square root of alpha viscosity over the Stokes number, which characterizes the, disk, the dust size. We also assume that the gas, small grains, and big grains components have the same temperature. And here are the results. For the one population models, you can see that different colors represent different uh, maximum particle sizes. But one thing is in common. You can see that the temperature 
steep is always outside the rank. Here is, it is at uh, outside 100 AU. However, if you look at the two population models, you're more likely to see the temperature dip is exactly at a position of the dust rain. And why is this a case? For the one population model, uh, we can use the shadowing effect to explain it. And it is well studied. We borrow the plot from Utah 2021. You see the uh, star radiates a lot of photons and it intercept with the disk. And this region will puff up and then block the lights to the outer disk, which casts a shadow to the outer disk. And then the temperature here will drop. After some several distance, some distances, the temperature will go up because the disk flares and it will receive the radiation again. For the two population model, we think it is due to the excess cooling of the big green particles. And we will I'll elaborate it in the next slide. So in our two population model, the dust size distribution is changing everywhere. Thus the opacity profile is also changing everywhere. We also know that big green and small greens have very different opacity profiles along the wavelengths. For the small greens, the opacity is quite large at, at this optical or in your infrared wavelengths, and the opacity is quite small at millimeter wavelengths. On the contrary, the big green particles opacity is quite gray, where it is a constant across all the wavelengths. This simply means that the big green is more efficient at cooling. And you can characterize this cooling by this epsilon parameter, which is the ratio between the opacity at this temperature over the opacity at the star's temperature, which can also be approximated by this opacity at millimeter wavelengths over the opacity at micrometer wavelengths. And this also has been studied while, uh, for a while ago. For instance, in Nures 1991's paper, this is characterized by this eta parameter. It is also mentioned in Chang and Goldreich's paper. But in their papers, the, this parameter is used to describe the vertical inversion on the vertical uh, dis distribution of the disk, not on radial direction, like we, dis we discussed here. So now let's, I'd like to use a very simple model to demonstrate this point. We have two populations. The big green population is concentrated here at the ring and the small greens are more spread out. And the, the opacity for the small green is the power law and the big green is a constant. If the disk only contains small greens, the temperature will be like a power law like this. There are drop of the temperature after the rain due to the optical depth effect, but more or less it is a power law. If your calculation only includes big greens, it is also a power law, but with lower values. This is just simply because the big greens has excess cooling, so the equilibrium temperatures is lower. If you include both small and big greens in your calculation, you will find that the equilibrium temperature will follow this blue curve. At the rain center, the big green will dominate, so the temperature will approach the big green only temperature. Outside the rain, the small green dominates, so the uh, equilibrium temperature will approach the small green only equilibrium temperature. And that explains why you see a temperature dip at the position of a dust continuum rain. This plot shows the equilibrium temperature ratios between two single size grains. On the y-axis, you see the particle size of the big grain. And on the y-axis, you see the particle size of the small grains. In some parameter space, this ratio can be as low as 30%. For instance, a big is one millimeter and A small is one micron. We also want to show the uh, RZ distribution 
of this temperature and density. On the upper panel, you see the small grain has a wider distribution, whether it is 10 to above the mid plane, and it also have a wider radial distribution. And the big grains are concentrated here. And on the temperature map, you can see that the, uh, here at the position of where big grains are concentrated, there's a temperature dip. If there is only small grain in the calculation, we won't see this, this part, but other things are the same. If your simulation only contains big grain, even though you see the big grains are concentrated here, but you still don't see the temperature dip at the position of the rain. This is simply because the opacity here is constant across the disk and there's no changing of opacity profiles across the disk. In previous slides, we talked about uh, the dust evolutions can influence the thermal structure, but you can do the other way around. The thermal structure can also have effects, uh, can also affect the dust evolution or the dust concentration by the dust radial drift. So you want to close this loop and then make another self-consistent model. To this end, we use a 1D dust evolution code. The evolution code uh, includes a single size approximation, the, which means that at given radius, the, there is characteristic dust size. And we also use the transition disk gas profile with the inner cavity, which is resemble uh, which resembles the late calcium 15 disk. We evolved the disk to 0.6 million years with a power law temperature. And then you can see at this point, there is already, there is already a ring at 75 AU. And starting from this point, we iterate the thermal structure with multi color radiative heat transfer at every 30 years, along with the dust evolution. And uh, the evolution looks like this. First, you can see that the ring is no longer Gaussian anymore. You can see something like a shoulder on the ring. And in some circumstances, the one ring can even split into several. So this means that the temperature structure can also lead to substructure formation in the dust continuum. And finally, we want to see that if our model can be applied in observations. And actually there are several examples. We all know that um, the map, Alma large program maps made a big news recently. Uh, the maps has observed uh, many molecular species in very high angular resolution and also very long integration time. And in one of their papers, Charles Law uh, compares the uh, substructures between the line emission and dust emission. And they calculated the fraction of overlapping substructures between these uh, two kinds of observations. And what they find is that the most frequent overlapping substructures are actually the chemical ring at dust gap and also chemical gap at dust ring. And this is exactly the prediction of this excess cooling mechanism in our model. Uh, to make some closer comparison, we plot the brightness temperature subtracted by a smooth polynomial feed of several CO isotope blocks for individual disks. The assumption is that lines are optically thick, so the brightness temperature reflects the temperature from the emission surface. First, let's see MWC 480. You can see at these two bright rings in dust continuums, the CO, uh, 13 CO and C18 O has a temperature drops exactly at these locations. It is similar in HC163. 296, you see uh, CO gaps, uh, 13 CO and C18O gaps 
at the position of the first and second and the third rings. You can also observe this in G -W GM Origi. You can see that the 13 CO and CHO line has a dip at this uh, dust continuum bright ring. In the paper published earlier this year, Ross Rosati also observed CI tau in very high angular resolution. And uh, they, they find a 13 CO temperature gap at the location of the second ring. And in their paper, they, they explain this by the shadowing effect. What they did is that they put a lot of mass on the, in the, at the first ring. And then after tuning some parameters, they can find a second, uh, they can find a temperature gap at the location of the second ring. But using our two population mod access cooling model, you can naturally explain why you can observe a temperature gap at the position of the ring. Um, so here is the summary slide. And in the end, I will say that uh, I worked with Lee as an undergraduate student, and I would really appreciate Lee for bringing me into this exciting field. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, giving me this chance to introduce this work uh, today. So my talk is titled Discovery of a Streamer Around the surf gravitating uh, Protoplanetary Disk. But the real message that I'd like to give, uh, especially Lee, is that uh, I am still interested in outbursts. I didn't forget. Uh, and yeah, as you know, among many other things, Lee is still obsessed with Upburst, and he still runs 1D code that I use for my PhD by himself. And he often sends me an email saying that I broke this code again. Can you fix me? Uh, can, can you fix it for me? And then I tend to be helpful most of the time. But in the last couple of months, I was moving and I was developing a new class at UF. So yeah, I didn't give him a timely reply to his email. So just wanted to make sure to Lee that I'm still interested in. Uh, and of course, I have this book, uh, Zawan showed this book, and I saw Carl also showed this book. Uh, and I also have mine, but I have two of them, as you, you might see here. Um, so why do I have two books? Uh, it doesn't mean that I did PhD with Lee twice. Uh, even if your advisor is Lee, you don't want to do PhD twice, right? So uh, what happened was, as soon as I decided to go to uh, Michigan as a PhD student, uh, I thought, because I was interested in protoplanetary disks and planet formation, I thought, well, I want to work with Lee Hartman, and I knew that he wrote this book. So I bought this book by myself, and I decided to go ahead, uh, head start, so that I can learn uh, what he is interested in and what I will I might be working on as my first year uh, project and PhD thesis. And then on the first day I met Lee, uh, I still remember your old office in the old Denison building. <laughs> so uh, we talked about what kind of things we can do. And then he gave me his book. And of course, I didn't tell him that I already have this book and I read it already. Uh, and, you know, who you know turn down if you get a free book, especially if it's from the author, right? So I didn't say that, but instead I asked Lee to sign this book. So this is what I what Lee wrote for me. Uh, in case you cannot read, uh, this is uh, dear Jehan, welcome to Michigan. I hope this book is of some help to you in your pro progress toward a long and successful career. Best Lee. So I'm not going to judge here whether my career is successful or not. But I can definitely tell you that I have been having the longest possible academic career so far since I didn't quit during my PhD, and I'm still in academia. So I'd like to thank you uh, for all your support, Lee. Okay, with that, uh, I will go back to the science. So I will start with uh, this picture we all might be familiar with, uh, the singular isotomosphere uh, that explains star formation and disk formation, right? So we have this cloud that is rotating at constant angular uh, speed. And this is great. Uh, this offers a clear view and elegant way of describing the gravitational collapse and star formation. 
but this model makes some quite strong assumptions. So here are a few. So it assumes that collapse, you know, it considers a collapse of an isolated sphere, okay? And the collapse as to the disk adds mass to the disk in a constant uh, and symmetric manner. So the accretion rate is dependent upon only the sound speed or temperature of the cloud. And it adds the disk, uh, mass to the disk in a symmetric, axisymmetric way, okay? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that such a, a simplistic view results in very stable and calm disk. Uh, this is one example where I ran two-dimensional simulation to make an outburst model. So what's happening is that, so we have a, uh, an envelope cloud. It's adding the mass uh, following rotating single isosomal cloud model. So it's a symmetric and the mass accretion rate from the envelope is constant but you are adding a lot of mass near the centrifugal radius. That's the outer radius of where the material is falling onto the disc. And the disc becomes, disc just cannot handle it. So this becomes uh, gravitationally unstable and it excites spiral arms. And as the spiral arms propagate inward, as you can see in the middle, from the middle panel, uh, the temperature rises to, due to the PDV heating and shock heating. So eventually the MRI, which we know that is not operating at least at the AU scale or beyond, right? It, it revives because the temperature is so hot and you have a lot of ionization, thermal ionization. So magnetic fields coupled to the disk gas and then MRI is turned on and that's how we produce, uh, how we generate this accretion outburst. That's all good, but in reality, uh, how are materials from the envelope to the disk uh, added? So how are materials added to the disk? And I'd like to connect how the accretion in parsec scale from the molecular cloud, you can see from here, to the disk accretion and eventually accretion onto the star. So we can have a look at some modern numerical simulations and there are many uh, out there. These are just few examples, but we can, we already know that most stars, at least in our galaxy, they form in cluster environment, like Orion, for example. And such a cluster environment, you cannot really assume that they are isolated when they form. And you can see from here, each panel shows each stars in the simulation, star cluster formation simulation. And you can see that they are dynamically very active, interacting with other stars, nearby stars. This is another simulation by another group. So what is so shown here, seen, shown here is a projected sphere around sink particles in star cluster simulation. So this is 50 AU sphere, and we are looking at how mass is accreted to the star or escaping from the star. And you can see that accretion is especially inhomogeneous. And this is from another simulation. Uh, this is actually from uh, Lee's uh, PhD student. Uh, Alexandra, and you can see that as a function of time on the x-axis, you see orders of magnitude different uh, accretion rate. So accretion is variable over time. We can now also look at observations thanks to ALMA. So this is the famous uh, disk HL tau. This looks very settled, very calm, although it has a lot of uh, bright rings and dark gaps. But when you look at the disk in gas, right? Remember that dust is only about 1% in mass in protoplanetary disks. So if you look at the gas, this is HCO plus, you see that this uh, white contour, this is showing the exact same uh, continuum size, continuum disk size. And you can see this tail-like structure uh, and this is peak intensity and the peak uh, velocity. And if you look at this carefully, it seems like some mature is falling onto the disk, but in a, a asymmetric manner, right? You see only one, perhaps there's another counterpart here, but it's at least not spherically symmetric. And we do see more and more of these structures, which the community starts to call as streamer. So here in this talk, I'd like to introduce yet another uh, example, and this is Eli Elias 227. Uh, Miriam already gave a great introduction to this source. Uh, this source is about half a solar mass star. 
and it's about 0.8 million year old. So it's still very young and it's located in Ophiuchus. And the most characteristic thing about this object is the two-armed spiral. And from observational point of view and theoretical point of view, we believe that the spirals are uh, driven by gravitational instability, not by a perturber. Uh, we speculate that because the disk mass seems to be pretty high. And also by looking at the pitch angle, as Zawan mentioned, you can use pitch angle to infer if it's formed by a uh, planet, perturber, or gravitational instability. And perturber, planet, they don't seem to be you know, explaining the pitch angle that we observe in a millimeter continuum. So it is likely that gravitational instability is exciting with two spirals. But again, as Zawan showed, uh, we see in gravitational instability simulations, in order to excite two armed spirals, you, re you need really, really large mass of the disk, uh, typically of order of stellar mass. Otherwise, you see very tightly wound uh, M equals five to 10 uh, modes. So it is really hard to get uh, two armed spirals unless you have ongoing mass addition in a very narrow radial reason. And this is exactly what we had uh, in our, our first simulation. So you have a ring, very narrow ring of reason where we put, we dump a lot of material, and then you can excite M equals two spider uh, without having the disk too massive. So it is reasonable to speculate that there might be some ongoing mass addition to the disk. So now we looked at the dust continuum and look at the scale. This is plus minus about two arc second, right? Uh, this is now plus minus 12 arc seconds. So the millimeter continuum is centered uh, at the very uh, center of this image. And here you are looking at C1800 equals three to two uh, transition using ALMA. And the beam size here is 0.3 arc second. And it is re uh, represented with the beam here. And on the right panel, it is 13 CO. And as Miriam already explained, uh, the eastern side of the disk is something weird. It's not axisymmetric, it's more extended in radius. And if you infer the emission surface, then uh, we get that the eastern side has lower emission surface. So something is going on. So as Owen mentioned, theorists need to connect theories with observations. So I decide to have a look at the data by myself in more detail. So when I looked at the C180 data, now in this panel, it's C180, but it's short baseline data with one arc second beam. So beam is a lot larger. And it turned out that if you look at disk with very small beam, you filter out large scale emission. And that's why we didn't see any streamers or background emission. Although you have some hint on this side, Eastern side here. But when you look at the data with coarse angular resolution, in this case, one arc second, you clearly see that there's something, some ambient medium uh, around the disk. And it is more clear if you look at the velocity, this is the peak velocity map. And well, although it's good to use peak velocity map or intensity map, essentially you are collapsing the three dimensional cube into two dimensions. So you are losing a lot of information in terms of velocity. So instead of doing that, I decided to look at the data in position, position, and velocity space. So this is three dimensional space, and we don't have to now uh, collapse the cube anymore. And you can see the disk uh, using this S shape, right? So this is the typical position velocity diagram. And then on top of that, you see this streamer here and two other, this purple thing and the black thing. So if you split those out, we see the disk rotation, capillary and beautiful red shifted and blue shifted side, but also we see this streamer. And these two components, we believe that uh, there's, there's some evidence that the disk continuum emission blocks those emission. So uh, if you look at this one, for example, you don't see an emission uh, at the location of the disk. So we believe that those two are uh, cloud material that is beyond the uh, the disk along the line of sight. So I wanted to look at the kinematics a little more carefully. Uh, although we are sensitive to the line of sight velocity only, we can already put some strong uh, limit on what's going on. So if you look at these contours, uh, here is where the relative velocity of this infilling gas is 
about free fall speed. Okay, so beyond that location, this part, the relative velocity between this mature in falling material and the system or the star and disk is greater than gravity uh, free fall time scale. So what that means is that at face value, this material doesn't seem to be initially gravitationally bound, but somehow dragged into this into this system. Two minutes. Okay, thank you. And we can also try to infer uh, the mass inflow rate. That's something we are interested in, uh, as well as angular momentum. So we can uh, assume that the emission is optically thin at C18, and we can assume some reasonable temperature range between 5 and 20K, and then I get this streamer, uh, total streamer mass. And you can also infer the velocity of the streamer, which will give you the time scale of infall. So if you divide the mass uh, with this info time scale, we get five times 10 to the minus nine to uh, 10 to the minus seven solar mass per year. And if you compare that with the stellar accretion rate, uh, six times 10 to the minus eight solar mass year, of course, it's not easy or straightforward to connect, you know, accretion flow at thousand AU scale to sub AU scale, but at least this is, I think, reasonable. What this tells us is that the stellar mass secretion rate can be sustained uh, by this infolding material. So here I showed only one object uh, today, but in this paper I'm in preparation, uh, we have many more objects. This is one of the objects where we see misaligned disk, uh, but also see this streamer, as you right got, Miriam already introduced this. Here's another one where we have misaligned disk and it's beautiful infolding stream. And this is an outbursting source. Uh, and we see two streamers holding onto the center star. Another outbursting star, uh, which is centered here, it has three streamers holding down to the disk, beautiful. I don't have any, I don't have any labels or color bar for these three uh, objects. This is not because I didn't learn how to make paper quality plots during my PhD, but this data is publicly available uh, on ARMA archives, so I decide to not reveal the details. Okay, so I will stop here, but I will I'll leave the open questions. So what we don't know yet is how common are these streamers and how dominant are streamers in the mass and angular momentum evolution of the disk and what kind of alpha turbulence or angular momentum transport they can produce. And are streamers responsible for stellar disk variability, disk misalignment, gravitational instability, binary formation, and outbursts? We don't have an answer to them yet, but this is certainly interesting. Do we see any trend as a function of age, right? Stellar mass, star forming environment. If you look at low, low mass star forming region, and if you compare that with Orion, for example, high mass star forming region, do we see any trend between those areas? And how can you prove the connection between the disk and streamer? With almost handful, more than handful object night right now, I don't think it's just coincident. Uh, it's, it's not just you know, coincidentally on our line of sight, but still we wanna prove the connection between disk and streamer and we can probably use some sharp tracers like SO or S SO2. And how much are these streamers extend beyond the current uh, field of view? So we have single field of view using ALMA, but how these structure connect to larger parsec scale structure? And what are the best tracers? They are often very embedded in their molecular cloud. So CO, 12 CO particularly is not very helpful in oftentimes. So what are the best tracers? So here I'd like to introduce one of the latest Lee's grandchildren, uh, Maria, who is a PhD student working with me on this exact problem. So I don't have answer to these questions right now, but hopefully uh, I will have these answers with Maria in the next few years. And with that, I'd like to advertise that I'm looking for more PhD students and a postdoc. So if you have any undergrad graduating undergrad grad students, please let me know. And I'll stop here with this picture that I took uh, two years ago. This was the last time I met Lee in person. And I'm looking forward to meet you again in the near future, Lee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. I think, um, well, we have a question from Patrick. 
Hello, Th thanks for nice talk. This is uh, Patrick Annabel speaking. Um, I, actually, it turns out that we, we have been doing um, similar work with Geoffroy Le Sur. So there is a series of paper by Geoffroy Le Sur and myself and, and from all. And um, I can tentatively uh, <laughs> provide some of the answer of the questions you uh, rose. Um, I mean, first of all, I would like to stress that, I, I mean, in our studies, we deliberately exclude self-gravity, okay, to concentrate just on accretions. And uh, so we, we found that uh, accretion uh, will generate an M equal two perturbations, even without gravity. Um, and uh, uh, we quantify the effective alpha it provides of, unsurprisingly, it depends on the accretion rate. So M dot over M. So it's, you cannot give a general answer. You have to know the accretion rate. But I would say for typical values, uh, it can be yeah, 10 to minus three easily. Um, right, so, and, and otherwise, more generally speaking, uh, uh, connected to collapse calculations, we indeed do find uh, that the combination of, of say gravity and well, turbulence uh, generates stream motions. And so, they, they, I mean, definitely, um, as long as the disk are accreting, um, the perturbations induced by those streams and the accretion is something important to consider. And so, generally speaking, quantifying the amount of accretions that uh, goes, the disk goes at different age is something important for the disk community that should be. I mean, we should receive some uh, efforts. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the comment, Patrick. And as you can see from this, my backup slide, yeah, I am aware of the work that you have been doing and with Geoff. And this is one of, uh, very similar to your work uh, in 2016 and 2017. But here, what's happening is uh, in my simulation, we have info in this case, again, as you said, I don't have any self-gravity. Uh, it's just info, but what's happening here is actually, if you look at the streamline from these collapse simulations, they are collapsing, well, their velocity is not Keplerian. So what that means is that if you were to draw the streamline of Keplerian disk, it will be just circular like this circle, right? So what that means is that infalling material, even without neglecting self-gravity, magnetic fields, whatever, it will have shear between the infalling material. There will be shear between infalling material and the disk material. And it will excite an instability that is pretty similar to Kelvin Helmut's instability just because of the velocity shear. And that is driving all these spirals. And if I generate uh, uh, yeah, synthetic molecular line observation, you see these all these faint um, spirals, which reminds me of AB Origa spider or RU loop. So basically, yeah, the same idea as your paper. Yeah, I appreciate your comment. And yeah, there are a lot more to, I think, left to look at uh, these info simulations. Uh, so, so Jayhan, I, I have an undergraduate now who's calculating, trying to calculate SEDS for the outburst thing, ha having, <laughs> having fixed it. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, presumably when we're looking at these things, we're looking at late time infall, right? I mean, we're not really in the protostellar phase. And so it's kind of like a infall light of, of you know, what must have happened earlier on. Uh, is there any way, do you think, as Patrick was saying, must be some combination of the infall rate and how much mass you have in the disk. Uh, is there any way, do you think, this is maybe more of an observational question about how to, you know, characterize the, the ratio of those things just from the structures, at least the ratio of them char characterized by, by, the, by the, the amount of structure or, or not generating structure uh, that you would see? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So from the theoretical uh, or simulation point of view, you can definitely run a grid of models bearing the disk mass and info rate or the ratio between them. And that I have an information of. Uh, from the observational side, I'd like to tell you that uh, these objects, well, SGO Riga is pretty old, but again, 
Elias 27, that's like 0.8 billion year. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you where those are, but I have sources that are as young as 0.3 million year, very deeply embedded, and also 0.5 million years old source. So I think there's possibility that we can uh, explore this observationally as well. Well, in terms of success, I mean, you, you got this uh, faculty job, so I think, you know, that, that counts. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, I think um, we'll move on to the next talk. So thank our speaker again. Thank you. So our last talk of the day um, is by Michael Meyer, who's at the University of Michigan. And he'll be talking about uh, circumstellar disk lifetimes versus stellar mass constraints on the gas giant planet mass forming, mass function. Um, okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can, and we can great. see your screen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here today and to share this talk with you. I wanted to first acknowledge the time I spent learning from Lee Hartman and others who are involved in today's meeting, um, mostly in these four buildings, uh, two of them out in Western Massachusetts and two of them uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And Lee was a member of my PhD committee. And I think I'm not the only person who has a statement something like this in the acknowledgments of their thesis, uh, thanking Lee for reminding me that something's not quite right here and there in the work that I've been doing. So thanks, Lee, for everything you've taught me. And hopefully, you know, I I, I realize now, Lee, you've never asked me to fix one of your codes. That's, that's interesting. Hmm. All right. Um, today's presentation is not a review. Um, so I apologize if I've left off some references that should have been included here. But what I want to tell you about are two interrelated projects. One is related to understanding how planetary mass companions to young stars might be thought of either as normal binary stars, as brown dwarfs, or as things that you would say were formed from planet-like processes. And I'll also then try to, um, once we, we tackle that a little bit, move into understanding a bit more why the distribution of the planetary mass objects might have the mass function that they have. And there are many caveats along the way. I'll acknowledge uh, uh, Fred Adams and Arthur Adams and Per Kalissendorf, who's a new postdoc, um, Adam Amara, a colleague in Portsmouth, and then uh, three undergraduates, uh, Nick Sussmill, Avery Peterson, and Annalise Ardizone uh, at the University of Michigan. Well, just to set the context for um, what I'm going to focus on with regard to planets today, uh, it's gas giants. So here are just a snapshot of some of the demographics of these objects as a function of orbital period. And on the right-hand side, instead of plotting the mass on the y-axis, we're plotting the radius. So we're focusing on the gas giants today above, say, Saturn mass. Um, the context for the planet formation part that I'm going to focus on today will be core accretion. And as many of you know better than me, that requires the uh, growth or creation of a core by hook or crook. Uh, once you've reached the critical mass for uh, gas infall, the structure, interior structure of the object can't support the gas that's on top of it, and it collapses and creates an opportunity for more gas to take its place, and this sets off this runaway gas accretion. And the question I, I'm going to try to focus on later is what stops that? Uh, what sets the masses of the forming planets? Is it um, terminated by the end of the lifetime of the disk? The old idea of gap opening, uh, if that's sufficient, or are, is there microphysics in the accumulation of materials, say, through a circumplanetary disk that creates the mass of the final planetary mass object. All right, so first let's talk about these low, low mass companions and whether they can be thought of as binaries or as planets. 
And I just separate into two um, broad categories here. The top one uh, that we think that binary stars or multiple star systems probably form through a variety of channels. And I list three here. Um, the distinction between the second and the third is just whether the disk is purely Keplerian or only partially uh, supported by Keplerian rotation. And all of these channels might have different amplitudes depending on the host star mass, depending on the orbital separation, and depending on the mass of the object. And so since we're going to focus on objects, say, below 30 Jupiter masses, uh, we wonder which of these channels might support those objects' formation. And in the bottom part of this slide, I mean to refer to planet formation the way we normally think of it in a Keplerian-supported gas and dust-rich disks. And as I said, I would focus today on the core accretion paradigm, but the distinction between the last uh, item in either the binary formation or planet formation part is more subtle. So we're going to focus on the planet uh, core accretion model, but first I want to kind of pull apart how we could tell the difference between planetary-like formation and maybe low-mass binary formation. And the reason why we're doing this, of course, is that all of these uh, surveys to find these objects can detect both. Uh, we see things, you know, uh, of 2 to 20 Jupiter masses, and it's not always obvious uh, whether that would, should really be considered a binary or a, a planet. And here are just some sensitivity plots from two direct imaging surveys. On the left, it's split out as a function of host star spectral type. And uh, you see that generally we're sensitive to things above a few Jupiter masses. And it's awfully hard to probe uh, inside of, say, 10 or 100 AU. So most of these things are, are at these larger 10 to 100 AU separations. All right, well, we're going to build a model to understand data like I just showed you, and that's going to involve uh, creating a planet-like part and a brown dwarf binary-like part. And there's a lot of work on binaries, and so we're going to take advantage of that. And the main thing we're going to use and assume, I should say, is the orbital distribution of companions. I'm referencing here studies for the orbital distribution of stellar mass companions uh, from these different surveys for A stars, uh, peaking out at uh, 400 AU, for FGK stars, famously peaking at 50, and for M dwarfs, peaking somewhat closer, uh, 10 or 20 AU. And some studies have uh, been picking apart the companion mass ratio distribution. This is where you build a distribution function of the companions to a star by the ratio Q, the companion mass divided by the host star mass. And some work that uh, a former student of mine, Madalena uh, Reggiani, did uh, some years ago, we found a, a relatively flat Q distribution, and, and many other researchers have found that over time. There are subtleties to this, and uh, that may obtain inside of 100 AU. There are uh, different distributions at maybe very, very close separations or very, very large separations, but we're going to see if we can reproduce this relatively flat distribution. A key assumption in the work that I'm going to present today is that these dis mass functions of companions are independent of orbital separation. That's almost certainly wrong at some level, but until we can really break that assumption in half, we're going to use it and see where it leads us. The other part of this uh, uh, story is the planetary part. And from early days of radial velocity surveys, um, uh, Andrew Cummings and colleagues de defined a planetary mass function, which was a power law. Uh, we love power laws because they're simple. And uh, this power law would have a slope in dn dm going as the planet mass to the minus 1.3 in roughly the Jupiter mass range. Uh, that early result was based on the detection of only 47 planets uh, back in 2008. So to be taken with a lot of caution, but since confirmed by this large uh, California legacy survey result and other results as well. So that's held up over time uh, reasonably well. And again, I'll ask the question whether we can recover um, this mass function in the modeling work I'll describe in a moment. And really, one question we have is whether this mass function changes as a function of host star mass. Okay, so here's the, the uh, 
complicated part of uh, this model I want to present to you where I will predict the number of companions a host star would have by adding up these two parts. The first part is the planet part, which will have a planet mass function and a planet orbital distribution. And the second part is the brown dwarf binary part, which will have a brown dwarf binary mass function and a brown dwarf orbital distribution, and they each have a normalization constant as well. The planet part, I'm going to fit to these data, I'll show you in a second, uh, a log normal distribution. So there's already hints in the literature and, and just from basic considerations that the planet orbital distribution is rising and it probably hits a peak and turns over. And so we'll choose a log normal to represent that and we'll be fitting for the mean and the uh, dispersion in that function. The planet mass function we'll take as a power law and we're gonna see if we can recover that alpha in this planet mass function power law. Similarly, on the brown dwarf part, uh, we're gonna fit the brown dwarf mass function just to see what comes out of the fitting, but we're going to assume that the orbital distributions follow exactly the same as the stellar binary distribution. So that's a strong assumption. And for each host star mass for the different surveys we're gonna consider, we have different uh, orbital distributions and I show them here for M, F, G, K, and A star. So that's an assumption. Anyway, if you put this all together, the model fitting has six parameters. There's an amplitude for the planets. There's a mean of the log normal for the planets, the dispersion in the log normal for the planets, and the power law of the planet mass function. And on the brown dwarf part, we're just fitting for the amplitude and the power law. And we're trying to try to fit this global model across all stellar masses. And that's sort of the, the thing we're gonna see if we can make work. We're predicting point estimates of companion frequency over different ranges of Q, the ratio of the companion to the star mass. So we can do this for A stars and M dwarfs and put the data together and over different separation ranges. So anyone who quotes a number uh, across these ranges, we can fit these data and we've assembled this database of about 35 data points that we're gonna to use to fit those six parameters. And here's what we get. So here's the corner plot of the MCMC -MC fitting. In this slide, I'm going to draw your attention to the power law uh, values, the indices, where the first one in the middle is alpha. And that does shockingly to me recover this alpha of 1.3 as the best fit, uh, similar to previous works for the planet mass function. And for the brown dwarf companion part, we get a beta of minus 0.47 plus or minus 0.6 or 0.5. So it's very uncertain. You can tell by the PDF there, it's very flat, but it's consistent with at least uh, this flat companion mass ratio distribution. I'll just point out that these uh, uh, PDFs here are not horrible. Uh, it could have looked much worse, so I'm at least happy they're peaky. Some of them are even symmetric. And an interesting uh, outcome of this fitting is that the gas giant planet orbital distribution, we can get a good fit to the log normal. It has a peak of about four or five AU, and you see the dispersion here. Um, so again, it goes up and it comes down. We did some similar work just for M dwarfs a few years ago uh, and published that paper uh, with a peak of about three AU. Uh, Rachel Fernandez has done some nice work uh, utilizing the Geneva radial velocity database from Mayor uh, et al. 2011. And then of course, the most recent uh, big legacy radial velocity survey from Fulton is consistent with this picture. Oops, got some updates popping on my screen. Now, if this fit holds, we can then take these two parts of the function, combine them together and predict the mass function of companions around different host star masses and at different orbital separations. So here are the results of combining those two parts. On the left-hand side, you have the orange planet mass function and the blue brown dwarf companion mass function, and you add them together to get the green. Uh, and on the left-hand side is the uh, M dwarfs. In the middle are the sun-like FGK stars. And on the right are the A stars. And what you find, this, is, this particular panel is for one to 10 AU. There's always a local minimum between these two functions. 
And uh, broadly, these data are consistent with other published results that we couldn't use in our point estimate table for a variety of reasons. The Schwarzwald result that I compared to the low mass star part is from a microlensing survey where you naturally get the Q distribution and it has this local minimum. And then some nice work combining RV and uh, astrometry from Johanna Salman and colleagues in Geneva find some similar results. But this one is the one I'm more interested in because this is the place where the direct imaging surveys are finding objects that we can compare such a model to. Again, the left-hand side is the M dwarfs, the middle are FGK, and the right are the A stars. And lo and behold, given this uh, way we're framing the problem in units of Q, the ratio of the companion to the host star mass, because this mass range that we're sensitive to between say uh, two and 20 Jupiter masses is a higher Q for low mass stars, we see a bigger contribution of binary companions, which is seen on the left-hand side in the strong blue line contribution to the green. And on the far right-hand side, you see that for the higher mass intermediate mass stars, you're much farther down in Q. And so that power law of the planet mass function dominates and more of the objects you see should be of the planet part of the combined mass function. So we're excited about these results and we we're, we're, uh, have a paper submitted, which I hope uh, we can share with everyone very soon to predict this local minimum as a function of host star mass and orbital separation and try to interpret more carefully these direct imaging results rather than calling them all planets or all brown dwarfs. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. I'm not gonna talk about why the orbital distribution peaks at, at uh, one to 10 AU, although you might think of the ice line, of course, um, but I'm gonna focus now on whether we can explain the mass function part. I, I'm ignorant in uh, doing detailed hydrodynamics, so I have nothing to say that hasn't already been said this morning uh, to think about orbital migration and, and how you could get that peak at uh, 5 AU. But let's talk a little bit about a mass function, again, assuming it doesn't change with orbital separation. We've known for a long time that disk uh, frequency falls off as, uh, as an exponential and various uh, fits to that exponential time constant um, are shown. And the hypothesis we wanted to test in this uh, next work is whether we could explain this mass function through uh, disk lifetimes alone, basically. And the answer is almost. So there are many ingredients to this paper led by Fred. The math in it is due to him. Um, and conceptually, we wanted to test this idea whether the uh, disk lifetimes could explain uh, the mass function that we see in the planets. So it's a core accretion model. We assume that the cores form at the ice line. We do some uh, back of the envelope stuff that I can manage uh, where the ice line location is proportional to mass and the core formation time goes as the square root of the mass if you use a Safranov time scale for the growth time as a function of orbital radius. And the um, accumulation of material across the hill radius goes as the hill uh, radius to the fourth power, that's the squared due to the area of the hill sphere, and another factor squared due to a density enhancement due to a shock, uh, and this which is more detailed physics, uh, which you can read about in the paper. The disk structure and evolution is all of the things I learned in uh, Lee's book, uh, talking about the mass surface density of the disk and alpha prescription, and the uh, observational result that the mass Accretion rate goes as the mass of the star squared and diminishes with time as the minus three halves. Uh, the disk frequency drops as this exponential. And what we've added is this time constant depends on the host star mass. So that disks uh, we know live shorter amounts of time around higher mass stars and longer around lower mass stars. And I'll go into that in a, in a moment. In addition to the disk lifetime as a random variable, we had to add in this other uh, random variable to take into account ignorance in the microphysics. So this would be uh, the efficiency of moving material from the circumstellar to the circumplanetary environment and from the circumplanetary disk onto the star itself. We just parameterize it uh, uh, with ignorance as a, a relatively flat prior in the log of this random variable. And that helps us recover uh, the mass function as a power law. There is a mass scale associated with this. I won't go into the detail, but it's related to the core mass and the product of the average or the uh, exponential time scale of the disk and the initial disk accretion rate. 
And these are the results. We get a power law mass function when we put all of this together. And the slope changes because it's not a pure power law. Uh, if it were, it would be nice, but uh, there are scales in the problem, as I mentioned. And so if you pick the higher scale where the product of that uh, um, average disk accretion rate and the lifetime is 10 Jupiter masses, then you get this blue line, which is closer to the um, uh, power law that we seek of minus 1.3. Interestingly, though, there is a change in the mass reservoir as a function of host star mass. So uh, this is a, a, a parameter of the mass supply, and it's the average m dot times the disc, average disk lifetime. And interestingly here, when we include that disk lifetimes depend on host star mass, you have a tension between higher mass stars disks going away more quickly, but the uh, core formation time scale depends weakly on stellar mass. And so there's a choke off point. At some point, you can't form a core fast enough before the disk goes away. And that leads to this plummeting at around three solar masses. And this was another motivation to do this work is a radial velocity result from Sabine Reffert and colleagues at Lande Sternwarte that uh, there are no retired A stars above three solar masses with an RV detected planet. So this helps to interpret that result. And at the low mass end, you just have a hard time building high mass planets because the disk accretion rates are so low no matter how long the disks last. We can then look at these power law slopes as a function of host star mass. Um, there's a sharper power law for the lowest mass stars. They, we get some convergence uh, at one to two solar masses and not plotted here, but for the highest mass stars, it would be steeper again. Um, now, what if we, we try, this is really the new work we're trying to do is to take a database of disk uh, frequencies from the literature this is just a beginning, and then fit for tau, the time scale, as well as the dependence on host star mass, fitting for tau naught and alpha in this case, and looking at the difference in lifetime between host star mass and doing this quantitatively so that other people could use this. Interestingly, we don't see any evidence for a change in disk lifetime uh, below one solar mass. Once you get to one solar mass and below, it seems to be the same, but above, it's definitely shorter, and it seems to be qualitatively consistent with models of photo evaporation. Right, so there's some support in the literature for this power law to shift a bit with uh, host star mass. This microlensing result on the left in blue has a steeper power law than the Cummings power law shown in orange. And on the right, alpha is the Nielsen uh, fit for the power law slope of the mass function. And again, it's steeper than the Cummings value. I should point out, however, that Brendan Bowler did some great work and colleagues in 2010 showing that their data for retired A stars required a relatively flat planet mass function. And that's not that tension is there and it has not yet been understood. All right, let me close. I know you're all probably very hungry at this point. Um, so the orbital fits to a through M dwarfs are consistent with a peak uh, at about uh, four or five AU in the planet mass function. This brown dwarf desert, and I didn't use that word yet, but it's this local minimum. I don't like the word desert because it presumes a lack of something, but in fact, the numbers that are there are exactly what you'd expect if you extrapolated the uh, binary companion mass ratio distribution all the way down to the opacity limit for fragmentation. And you always normally get this uh, local minimum. And that location depends on host star mass and orbital separation. We do expect that around M dwarfs in our direct imaging surveys, as sensitive as they are today, to be dominated by brown dwarf companions for low mass stars and gas giants for the higher mass stars. And then finally, with reference to this paper by Fred Adams uh, et al., uh, the model reproduces the power law mass function, assuming it's due to disk lifetimes. Now, that is not a unique solution. There are other theories that could explain this, but we wanted to explore this hypothesis, whether disk lifetimes could play an important role along with this other random variable. And it does predict a stellar mass dependence uh, that depends on host star mass, which needs to be explored further. Um, finally, I'll just say that, again, I've assumed that the uh, mass function of companions is independent of orbital separation. That's surely wrong, and breaking that will hopefully lead to new insight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, do we have any questions for Michael? 
Is everyone just really hungry? <laughs> uh, anybody on Zoom have any questions? Patrick? <laughs> Thanks, thanks, very interesting. I would like to know whether using this type of approach, you could place constraints on the time uh, at which the planet will start forming. I mean, as, um, I mean, the reverse, not, not, not the, yeah. The, 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 yeah, because it's a very important, uh, um, I mean, we, we, I mean, to some extent, the recent picture which is emerging is that there is a kind of co-evolution or co-formation between planets and and stars, and knowing exactly where the planet formation starts is something important for people like me who do uh, star formation to some extent. Thanks, Patrick, and that that's a good context for this approach, which I would say is phenomenological. Right, we're sort of mixing some very basic ideas with some observational results and seeing what constraints can be placed. If there were enough data, exactly, uh, as you say, we could try to invert this and explore different versions of whether the core formation time depended on the square root of the host star mass and whether the ice line location was the right place for this core formation. This would be uh, very valuable. We're not there yet, but in principle, exactly what you suggest could be done. Robin, in the back. Um, picking up on that you just said you just need more data. Um, what kind of data would you want to prove or disprove um, this model? Like, what would you want? Like, of course, <laughs> um, yeah. all, the, all the data that you would get, but like, what would be um, feasible that you would like to have on data? One of the most valuable things at the moment would be uh, constraints on the planet mass function around M dwarfs. And we are really looking forward to continued results from radial velocity surveys of M dwarfs, in particular, the Karmanis survey would be great. Um, we are also involved in a direct imaging study of B stars. And that uh, is work led by uh, Marcus Janssen. Uh, which is really pushing this kind of model to the breaking point because, as I showed, uh, there really shouldn't be much uh, beyond, uh, you know, two and a half solar masses. So that's going to be extremely telling. The general answer to your question is the extrema, right? Going to the highest and lowest mass ends and getting much better constraints on planet mass functions for specific cohorts rather than to say, well, it's mostly an FGK star sample. There's some M dwarfs in and they're consistent with each other. Better if we could really pull apart these things from each individual discovery technique. Um, Hans, would you like to ask a question? Okay, thank you. Hi, Michael. Um, about the semi-major axis distribution, this log normal with a with a sort of a peak around somewhere in one to ten solar masses, uh, ten AU. This means that um, that when the stars evolve to become red giants and white dwarfs, these planets will probably not be swallowed, which implies that uh, imaging studies of white dwarfs should find giant planets somewhere uh, because uh, the orbits will, will widen with mass loss. So we did such a search. Well, we didn't find any planets at, at the white separation, giant planets at white separations. So could you comment on, on such efforts to find those planets far out around white dwarfs? Yes, Hans, great to hear your voice. Thank you for the question. That older work on the initial surveys, wonderful stuff. I think JWST will be an excellent uh, uh, tool for exactly that. And I believe there's an approved program in cycle one for just this sort of thing. Uh, it's also worth commenting that there are now a couple of uh, transits uh, planets discovered around white dwarfs. And this is very exciting as well. Yeah. Contra to what you were just describing about the orbits expanding, but uh, fascinating to wonder, you have mass loss, but also dynamical friction, and who is going to win as a function of orbital separation? 
Yeah. Okay, but there should be some out there. I wonder who is the author or the the is the consortium in cycle one in JWST who is doing this. I don't recall, but in the Slack, I'll put the name when I find it on the link of approved cycle once. Oh, oh, send me an email because we were thinking of putting in a proposal exactly on this. All right. Well, thank you again very much, Michael, and thank you to all of our speakers uh, from this morning.